Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled People Stories. Today we have a very special episode for you, a compilation of some of the best Entitled People Stories we've read over the past year. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a few hours of the most Entitled People you've ever heard of. And by the way, Karen assured me that for every thumbs up this video gets, she won't try to get anyone fired for an entire week. So please smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. My girlfriend has too many pets. I'm putting an end to it. We've been together for 12 years. We have a one month old baby and we're full of animals. We have four bathrooms and three of them are occupied with animals. One of the bathrooms is owned by a bunny, the second is owned by three cats and the third by another pair of cats. In our basement, we have six puppies, two months old, that were born to a stray dog that my girlfriend took around a year ago. Our ceiling, top floor, is completely occupied by another three cats. And our living room is the place where our chihuahuas live. She never takes them out, so every single morning I wake up and the floor is full of doggy doo. On the stairs between the first and second floor, there's a bunny, which is in a big cage, I'd say. Every single animal room is getting completely destroyed and we're on rent, so I'm super worried if in any case, the landlord asks to come around. Outside of the house, the stray dog lives in the garage, and when it's closed, it goes to the bathroom in there. There's still mess from around two weeks ago. We also have six Japanese Akitas, for which I bought a separate house so my mom can take care of them because I no longer can walk them and give them the proper love. Since I found out my girlfriend is pregnant, I've been starting to work two jobs. I've hired a cleaner and I'm away for 12 hours a day, 6 days a week. I realized that I could be helping more with the baby, but that's what the situation requires. Recently, I've tried to convince her to reduce the cats, remove the bunnies, remove the stray dog, and give out the puppies from the basement, but she simply refuses. I'm okay if we keep four of the chihuahuas because she really loves them, but I can't take the mess around the house anymore. I'm scared that when our daughter passes the 6 month mark and starts moving around, she could get dirty or just be restricted to a single room. Last but not least, I'd like to have more than 2 or 3 kids and I just can't imagine them living in this kind of a situation. In a recent conflict, I decided I can no longer allow this and said that it's up to her to decide if she wants to live with me and our daughter or rather have all the animals for whom she doesn't take care of. Am I a total jerk for giving her such an ultimatum? Edit. In regards to buying a house and renting, we're living in Eastern Europe. A house here could be around 40,000 euros in a small village. We're renting because we live in the capital. Yikes! This is what you need to do ASAP. 1. Take the baby and go stay somewhere else, maybe with your mom for a while. 2. Get a family lawyer to help you navigate. 3. Get your kid's mom to a therapist. She's not well enough to care for her kid. 4. Work with animal control to relocate those poor animals. 5. You'd probably have to pay a lot of money to your landlord for how the place was destroyed. 6. You're the jerk for letting it get to this point. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his girlfriend? Please let us know. If this was a reality show, I'd totally watch it. Why I'm not sharing my grandmother's inheritance with my father. When I was 13 years old, my mother found out my father was having an affair and he got the other woman pregnant. After this came out, my father confessed he was in love with the other woman and wanted to leave my mother. She obviously was heartbroken and didn't know what to do. We had moved to a new state with my father for work, so she had no family around. My father dropped us like a bad habit soon after this came out. He attempted to keep a relationship with me, but ultimately his new family was his priority, as he said. Tough to understand for a 13-year-old, but whatever. If he didn't want me, I wasn't going to need him, so my mother and I moved on. But the only way we were able to move on was with the help of my grandmother, my father's mother. She always loved us and was appalled with what her son had done to us. He stopped seeing her as well for the most part. We became very close over the years, seeing each other for special occasions and holidays while her son was nowhere to be found. She even helped my mom out monetarily when we needed it too. Unfortunately, the years caught up with her and she developed colon cancer. Advanced late stage, her decline was rapid. Within a few months, she was in hospice. Days before she passed, she asked me to call her son to come see her as she knew her time was coming. He had only been to see her a couple times since she had gotten sick. When he came by, I was visiting as we did every few days 
and he acted like I was some random person. Grandma asked him to come back tomorrow, but he said he'd be back in a few days. She passed four days later without him coming back, despite my calls and texts to come. She went peacefully with me and my mom by her side. That was hard. I miss her every day. She was my guardian angel most of my life, and I know she continues to watch over me. After the services, where my father did show up and made a big scene and made it about himself, we were contacted by her lawyer. Unbeknownst to everybody, she left me her house and a good amount of money, $200,000. No idea she did that, but in the will, there was a note to me from her that said, You are worth it. Love, Grandma. She's amazing. Also in her will, she left my father exactly $1 as his inheritance. When he found out, he went ballistic, blowing up my phone all the time, demanding I give him his house and his money. His new wife and his son were messaging me a lot, and his son was writing on social media that I manipulated my grandmother. My father apologized and said he was under a lot of stress because he's in debt and was banking on this money to come in for bills and to send his son to college. That made me feel bad, like maybe I should give him something. I've thought about it a lot and I don't think I'm going to share anything with him and I kind of think that makes me a jerk because it seems like they really do need it. But on the other hand, forget him. I don't know, am I the jerk? Not the jerk. The reason she left him $1 was to make it clear to the court in case he tried to challenge the will that she hadn't forgotten to include him, but that she intended to disinherit him. She knew that her son would try to take the money she left you. It is very common practice to leave $1 when disinheriting someone. Respect your grandmother's wishes and don't give your father a dime. Edit to add, yes people, I'm very aware that this isn't necessary to disinherit someone and that it comes with the added annoyance of having the disinherited person be named a beneficiary. Just because it's unnecessary doesn't mean that people don't do it, and it's still very effective in making the deceased's intentions clear. As soon as I read that Grandma left him $1, it was clear she knew exactly what she was doing. OP, she wanted him to have exactly what she left him. Continue having no contact. You know he is not worth the headache. Clearly, Grandma was pretty sharp. And if she thinks OP is worth it, that's all that matters. Not the jerk. But still, he is your dad. The boy is your half-brother. Blood doesn't matter, and life is too short to remain angry. They have money problems, so it would be a nice olive branch if you help them out. Maybe take an example from Grandma and send a dollar. That way, you've doubled their inheritance. A 100% increase is not to be sniffed at. Put the check for $1 in with a letter explaining that you've thought long and hard remembering your grandmother and taking into consideration what she meant to you and what she so clearly meant to him. You have decided that he is right. He does deserve more of her legacy to remember her by, so you are going to double his inheritance. Then immediately block him, his wife, and his son on everything and go on living your best life. Well, what do you think? Should OP give any of this money to her father or not? Please let us know. I'd give the three of them 33.3 cents each. My fiancé sold my train collection behind my back. I, 28 female, lived with my aunt and uncle as my parents could not raise me. My uncle started collecting trains as a hobby when he was working as an engineer. I took a huge interest in them as a kid and as a teenager. My uncle gave me his entire train collection when he became sick. When I turned 19, I moved out and found a nice apartment near my college. I brought the collection with me. Some of my friends thought it was cool, others find it weird. I met my boyfriend in college and he moved in with me after we graduated. We got engaged last year and are currently struggling with debt, student loans, and the wedding. My fiancé asked if we could have an expert come into the apartment and price the train collection. I was against the idea and told him that I would not sell the collection as it was a large memory of my uncle. My best friend got engaged this past weekend and a few of us went to celebrate at her parents' lake house. I was gone for two nights, and when I returned, the train collection was completely gone. My fiancé came running over, saying that a collector came and gave him a decent price for the set. I started crying and yelling at him that he destroyed my trust and told him to leave the apartment. He left without protest and has been staying with his parents. I told him that he had to pay me back all the money. I did threaten to sue him as well. His parents are trying to argue that he was only doing what he thought was best for both of us. Am I the jerk for demanding my fiancé pay me back for selling my train collection? Not the jerk. Your fiancé stole and sold the train collection without your consent. Please go back to that collector and explain the situation. File a police report 
and sue your fiance for grand theft. And OP, please break up with him because he completely betrayed your trust. You cannot get married to someone who has no respect for you. What an awful man. File a police report. Your ex committed a crime and depending on the value, a very serious crime. Provide the police report to the collector so they clearly understand they purchased stolen goods. Also, that collector could be shady too. He purchased it, likely knowing your ex didn't really own it. Edit. Yes, it's a stretch to assume the collector knew the ex didn't have permission to sell them. I made that assumption thinking that the ex didn't know anything about the trains and possibly stated that they were his girlfriend's trains. Not the jerk. But you can report that collection is stolen so you could potentially get it all back. The sale of stolen goods is not legal. I would act fast though, checking with police, because depending on the collector who bought it, they might be selling off some of the pieces and then it might be impossible to get them all back. And him giving you the money he got from selling your stuff isn't even an apology. I wouldn't act like it was. That money is yours, completely yours, and probably is worth way less than the actual collection. Do not touch that money though. Report the whole thing as stolen. If you get the money, it could be argued that you knew and benefited from the sale. And this is a pretty good insight for how he will act during your marriage. Going behind your back to make what should be joint decisions after you already said no. Keeping that money as his own. Saying that he knows best to do what's good for both of you without taking your opinion into account. Am I the jerk for uninviting my mom for my wedding when she kept insisting on my stepson not being there? It's a stupid thing to ask, I know. But my mom's been an important person in my life and I'm not sure if perhaps I overreacted. I, 26 male, met my soon-to-be wife, Amy, 25 female, 7 years ago. Her son Jason was 11 months old and she broke up with his dad already. I love Jason as my own son and that's how I see him. He calls his dad, dad, and he calls me, pa. My mom didn't like the idea of me being with someone who already had a kid with someone else. We fought about that during the first two years of the relationship until I threatened to stop talking if she doesn't accept Amy and Jason in my life. So she let it go and didn't bring it up ever again. I proposed four months ago. We're supposed to get married in March. My mom offered to pay for half of the wedding and we accepted. The issue was my mom was saying Jason shouldn't be at the wedding because it would be just as weird as if her ex was there. We were both confused by that logic. Jason's a huge part of our lives. It's our wedding, so of course he's going to be part of it. That was a hard no from both of us. She tried to bring it up more times until finally she pulled the I'm paying for your wedding, so I'm allowed to decide card. That's the part that got me the most. She wanted to use the fact that she's helping to pay to keep our 8-year-old from being there at our wedding. I paid her back the money she gave us for the wedding and told her she's also not invited. Now she keeps calling, crying, that I'm her only son and it would be heartless keeping her from being part of this huge milestone in her life. To her, it's not the same if Jason missed it because he's a kid, not a parent. My family is on my side about her going too far for wanting to exclude my son, but they think I'm the jerk if she's not invited since I already gave her the money back so she has no say in anything. I'm just so mad about it and I don't want to see her after she tried to control things like that. Am I being the jerk? Not the jerk. Your mother is acting like a monster to that kid. She can kick rocks. Why would you want such a nasty and mean person anywhere near you or your future family on such an important day? You did the right thing. Not the jerk. She's been a jerk about your son his whole life. It's really weird that she felt he shouldn't be at the wedding. It's up to you whether or not to invite her. I wouldn't unless she grew up and apologized and promised not to act like a jerk at the actual wedding. And then I'd be concerned she'd make some sort of a scene. Next time she calls, I would explain that this is entirely her fault and that even though she disagrees, Jason is your kid as well as your fiancé's. ETA. Others have made this point and I agree with it. If you have kids in the future with your fiancé who are biologically yours, your mother will treat them differently and obviously so. Then she treats Jason. Bear that in mind. I'm all for going low contact and if she doesn't wise enough, no contact. An onion allergy. Received an Uber Eats order tonight stating, no green onions or onions, onion allergy. Their order had two items, a house salad and a miso ramen. Now, we take allergies very seriously. We're a Japanese restaurant and of course have people who come in with deathly shrimp allergies, apparently looking to play Russian roulette with their sushi. Any good restaurant should. Whenever people say, no this, please leave out that, 
I immediately ask if it's an allergy or dietary restriction, etc., to ensure we can honor it appropriately. We've gotten vegetarians who have accidentally eaten our ramen, not veggie friendly, because another waitress just thought no chicken was fine and didn't warrant any further questions. Anyways, onions. There's onions in a lot of our foods. Our dressing is practically half onion. Can't take onion out of it. I checked the ranch, the only other dressing we have, onion. Ah, <sighs> the ramen also has onions and green onions. We can't take those off, so I attempt to call the customer and it goes straight to voicemail. I leave a message and ask that they please call back. Meanwhile, the order timer is ticking and is already assigned to a driver. I went to check with my boss that the base of the ramen didn't also have onions and he confirmed it didn't. But then he paused and said that the sauce the chicken is cooked in has onion in it. So now, basically, this whole guy's order is worthless because it's all got onions in it. Boss says just cancel the order. We don't do this often, but we don't want to risk it. There's no way to do this order without basically sending him just noodles with a few small veggies and broth and a plain salad, which we knew he wouldn't want. I go to the tablet and no way to cancel it. Uh-oh. Takes a few minutes, but I contact customer support and they cancel the order. Two seconds later, bing, new order. Same guy, same order, minus the salad and no allergy note. I stood there holding the order slip for a moment before confirming with my boss. Cancel? Cancel. Knowing that they told us about the allergy, I couldn't in good faith send out an order now with onions just because they resubmitted the order without the notes. I tried calling the customer again, still straight to voicemail. Same message, left another note for him, no response. What would you have done? Would you have fulfilled the second order without the allergy note, even with knowing that it was the same person and they had alerted you to an allergy earlier? Or would you have canceled it like I did? I feel like if he had called us, we could have talked it out. Maybe it wasn't an allergy, but a preference. But I didn't feel right with the word allergy on the order, sending out basically a dangerous meal to this person and we could be held liable for it. Edit. I appreciate the positive responses. I'm glad to hear that I seem to have done the right thing, even if I may have upset the customer. I didn't want to take any risks. Nope, you all did the right thing. I wouldn't risk it either. And forget them for not answering the call. There's a reason you have to give a phone number when you place an order so they can call you if there's a problem. You definitely did the right thing. Just because they don't put allergy on the second order doesn't mean that there isn't one. And there is no reason to risk not only your job, but the business should something have happened to that person. Am I the jerk? I ate an entire cake by myself in a single day. Yesterday was my 27th birthday. I haven't had a birthday cake for many years because my wife felt that it would go to waste considering it's just the two of us at home. So she would just buy two slices of cake, one for her and one for me. This time, however, I wanted a cake for my birthday. I've been feeling down lately and thought that maybe a birthday cake would uplift my mood. So I asked my wife if she'd bake me one of her famous plum cakes. She usually makes it for girls' nights and family potlucks, etc. She agreed on the condition that I'd have to finish the entire cake and not waste any of it because she'd only be able to eat one slice of it. I happily agreed to her condition and she got on to baking the cake. Yesterday morning, we cut the cake and she had a slice for breakfast. She then said that I'd have to finish the cake by the end of the day because she didn't want any cake left over. I managed to finish the rest of the cake during the course of the day pretty easily. When my wife came to know that I had finished the cake, she started scolding me, calling me greedy and a pig. She said she didn't think I'd be such a glutton and finish the entire cake all by myself. She also said she's never making cake for me again. Am I the jerk? Edit. To all the people wishing me happy birthday, thank you. Your wishes made my day happier. I'm sorry I couldn't reply to each one of you because there were just too many wishes. Not the jerk. Your wife clearly wanted to prove you were a glutton for wanting a whole cake and not being able to finish it, therefore wasting food. You proved her wrong, so now she's angry. Also, cake can last more than one day. OP. The thing is, she feels that cake becomes dry and loses its moisture if it's not eaten on the same day. Your wife is wrong. Has she never heard of Tupperware? Some cakes are actually better on the second day. I'd imagine a plum cake is one of those. All joking aside, I think the reason your wife is being weird about the cake is because she's on a keto diet and doesn't trust herself around it. So she wants you to eat the whole thing so that she won't be tempted to eat more. But at the same time, she perhaps feels jealous that you can eat the whole thing. I'm doing keto myself. I love baking. There are some wonderful websites, including Nom Nom, 
I Breathe I'm Hungry, The Sugar-Free Londoner, etc., who all have fabulous keto baking recipes. Maybe if your wife made the cakes keto, then she'd be a bit less controlling about you eating them. Like you could eat them over a few days because it would be okay for her to have a slice every day as well. I'd imagine a plum cake made with almond meal would be fairly delicious in and of itself. And the sweeteners these days are almost indistinguishable from sugar. My favorite is allulose, which is amazing. Am I the jerk for refusing to accommodate my niece's vegan diet? My sister and her husband both lost their jobs, and as we had the space, we allowed them to move in with us. They have two daughters who are both vegan. Now, my wife and I have four kids. Our two older girls are very sweet, and our boys both have autism. We essentially work our daily lives around them to make them more comfortable. As such, our meal plans are relatively simple. Some of the only foods they will both eat is chicken and cheese, so every meal we eat has at least one of those components. Of course, neither of these items are vegan. Our nieces both complain, and as we need mealtime to be relatively stress-free for the boys, it's caused some problems. On top of this, we also have four dogs. One family dog, one dog who is a trained autism service dog, and our eldest daughter adopted two dogs at the beginning of April last year. Our oldest is doing an animal welfare course at college and plans on becoming a vet slash dietitian. She explained the benefits of raw food, and as such, she prepares all four dogs' meals in the morning and refrigerates their evening meals. We don't force her. She chooses to do the other two dogs because she wants to get it perfect for them. Anyway, our two nieces are complaining about never being able to eat because there's always meat around. They refuse to eat at mealtimes because we serve meat and dairy. I explained that we aren't going to upturn meal plans we've had in place for years just for them. They could either deal with it or make their own food. They're both on hunger strikes, but I don't think I'm in the wrong. I offered to serve the sides, which are generally vegan, and larger portions for them. But cooking several different meals is not something I want to go back to. My sister is staying out of it, and her husband is just happy he's finally getting to eat meat again. My wife thinks I'm being harsh, but when I suggested she take over cooking, she suddenly agreed with me. Am I the jerk? Neckbeard tries to buy cheap parts to save money on his PC build. Since my last story went over so well, I guess I will share another from my time at Macropoint. Now, some people believe the customer is always right. This is a problematic belief. The truth is, most of the time, the customer is an entitled jerk, but you're supposed to perform admirably anyway. This gets harder when you're dealing with anyone who thinks they know something that they do not. So a guy comes into my department and I greet him at the carpet. I tended to be Johnny on the spot whenever someone came in. Welcome to our build your own department. I'm Anna Mouse. What are we putting together today? The man scoffs at me and says, A computer, obviously. All attitude. He was a neckbeard wearing a My Chemical Romance shirt, pants so tight that he had a mushroom top and a mismatched shoes. This was obviously on purpose, as both shoes were clean, just didn't fit his look. I didn't take much time examining him. My dad had always told me I got to get the measure of a man with a glance and look him in the eye the whole time. He literally used to test us on this crap. Turn, look, then tell him what cars we saw in that split second. I was decent enough at it, but not great. I instead would tell myself little lyrics on the fly to remember key details. It's become a life habit. I explained this to point out that I wasn't staring at his look, so I'm pretty sure the snickering hens in the general section who didn't work for us were the source of his ire about being judged about his look. He took my smiles as me thinking something was funny. I feigned ignorance, like I didn't hear him, and then when he asked again, I apologized and asked him to speak louder. Told him I was hard of hearing. This relaxed him a bit, thinking I couldn't possibly have heard the hens giving him the business. I did, but I wasn't going to show it. With an attitude, he handed me a list and leaned forward shouting, I don't want to be sold nothing. Here's what I need. Go get it. I look at the list, and it's pretty thorough. Names of items and SKU numbers. I'm like, bet. This looks like a full build. Good money, though a lot of them I identify as cheaper parts. I tell him it'll take me a few minutes and invite him to take a look around in case he sees anything else he might need. He rudely says he'll wait there and he ain't buying anything else. So don't try none of my snake oil sales crap on him. I smiled and said, oh no, but it's so good for the joint and muscles. He didn't think it was funny, so I just walked away and got his stuff. Halfway through grabbing his items, I realized that he only looked at prices and not what each thing did. His build had an AMD processor, but he wanted an Intel board. 
The case he wanted was slim and the video card he wanted would not fit. He needed the lower profile, though the Intel board had integrated graphics, so I wasn't sure why he picked a card. Also, the power supply he wanted was of lower quality and wattage than the one that came with the case. All in all, I was compelled to ask what the heck he was trying to build. I gathered everything quickly and brought it up, going over each piece with him and getting his approval. I then asked him if all of this was for the same build, which he replied with a something smart like, wow, how observant of you, or something like that. I smiled and tried to inform him that some of those parts would not work together, but he simply cut me off. Listen, I don't need you trying to upsell me. I've been building computers for a while. I know what I'm doing. He did not, and I wanted to question that validity of his claim. I asked him then if he would like to hear about our return policy just in case. He got belligerent, telling me he knows what he's doing and how dare I treat him like he's stupid just because of the way he looks. Granted, he did look stupid, but I think his ire was more for the cute girls giving him crap and some insecurity versus anything I said. Alrighty, you are not interested in our return policy or extended warranty policy, right? I confirmed. We're supposed to ask about the warranties for everyone, but I figured he was not going to take kindly to that, so all I wanted to do was cover my basis. Warranties are for suckers. Do I look like a sucker? He snapped. Yes, he did, but I wasn't going to say that. I just smiled at him and asked if I could double check his list to see if I got everything. I whipped out my phone and took a picture of everything along with the list. I knew most of this was coming back and let him go about his day. I didn't even sticker it. I knew what was coming. Two days later, Neckbeard shows back up. Muffin top, two different pairs of shoes, and an anime t-shirt that made Goku look like he had a fisheye head. He looked embarrassed and angry. He had with him someone who I at first thought was his girlfriend, a little Latino woman who I was certain was either blind or a gold digger, but turned out to be his sister absolutely no resemblance. She was friendly and told me she was trying to build a gaming computer to play Crisis. I was a little incredulous, young and, to be honest, at the time, did not think girls played games like that. So I turned to him and said, Crisis? And he shrugged. Little lady stepped up and reiterated herself, with a bit of friendly mocking because she knew what I was thinking. Apparently, she got crap for being a gamer girl. I just shrugged and told the truth. There was no way in heck that previous build was going to play Crisis very well. The brother, whom I'm going to call Neckbeard from here on out, had an attitude. He said yeah and handed me another list, this one similar to before. He made no explanation for his previous mistake and just told me to get the new items, along with the same line about not upselling him. I looked at the list and knew right away that build wasn't going to play that game very well. I mean, I could get him there with a $1,500 build, barely, but this was something like $900, and that video card, don't remember what it was, was not going to cut it. I told him so, and that maybe he should look at the game specs online, which would help him make a better decision. He told me he had done his homework and to just get what he said. I looked at his sister, pleading, and told her that I could come up with a system that was both affordable and would run the game decently. He interjected and got mad, threatening to get another salesperson. I said okay, but I knew he would be back again. As I'm getting his stuff, I hear him, away from his sister, on the phone. He's telling someone that he wants to finish this up and get the build done. Apparently, his parents had allocated some money for this, and he was trying to get a cheap system so he could keep the rest of the money. A real jerk move, but not my problem. I gathered what he asked for and sent them on their way. Didn't tag this stuff either. It was either coming back or it could go to the pool. I saw Neckbeard two days later with little sister in tow and his parents. He was not dressed like a disaster that day. His parents did all the talking. There was no list. They told me they had trusted their son to get this done because he was good with computers, but the game wasn't working properly and they were trying to get everything together for their daughter's birthday, which had apparently passed after the first time I met Neckbeard. The parents then told me they only had $3,000 to spend on this computer. They had looked up the average price of high-end gaming rigs and wanted to buy an Alienware but were convinced by their son to build it themselves, possibly so he can control what they spent. $3,000? This man was trying to snake his parents out of like 2,000 bucks with these crappy builds. They told me to put together something that would work, and I smiled at Neckbeard and said, With a $3,000 limit? They confirmed, and I grinned. Cue malicious compliance. I tell them I can definitely do that, and ask if they want to come with me and discuss each part piece by piece, and why I think they need it for the game. 
I go with them and I build a $3,000 system. Neckbeard is losing his crap. Why do we need this? Why do we need that? But no one will listen to him because of his previous failures. I built a system that I'd be proud to own and got it around $2,700 and then explained the warranty and how they would have us build it and have parts and labor on that warranty. Of course, they took it. Neckbeard was angry because we went a little over and I even talked his parents into getting a boss monitor for the game. These, I certainly stickered. If Neckbeard hadn't been such a jerk, I'd have built him a system that could play the game and he would have been able to go about his fiendish plan and keep his parents change. Instead, he got nothing and his sister got a build that she loved and a case that she apparently always wanted, a white Antec with purple fans. Moral of the story is, don't be a jerk to your salesman. Tell them what you want and need and they will accommodate most times or at the very least, know what the heck you're doing. If he had known computers like he claimed, this wouldn't have been an issue. Either way, I'm glad things didn't work out for him. And this time, there were no returns. I banned my best friend's girlfriend from our kitchen. I, 26 male, live with my best friend, Brian, 26 male, in a rented house. Sometime in September, Brian started dating Cindy, who's around 24. Brian can't cook at all. He can make scrambled eggs, instant ramen, frozen pizza, and that's about it. He doesn't even know how to cook rice. I, on the other hand, am a great cook, and I occasionally, three to five times a month, cook for him as well. Cindy has been staying over more and more often, and a few weeks ago, she was sleeping over on the same day I cooked for Brian. She was apparently really shocked I cooked it because it tastes like it's from a pricey restaurant. Brian made the mistake of mentioning that I offered to teach him to cook. Cindy decided that this offer automatically extends to her as well. She came to me and told me I can teach her. She didn't ask, she just told me. I told her I wouldn't. We went back and forth. She thinks I have to because I promised Brian I'd teach him, but he doesn't want to. Cindy also doesn't know how to cook anything. She thinks she is entitled to cooking lessons because she's dating my friend. She kept pestering me about this for almost three weeks and only stopped when I asked Brian to talk to her. Now last week I got home and could immediately smell burnt food. I walk into the kitchen and there she was. She tried to make crepes, burned them to a crisp and was scraping them with a metal spatula on the nonstick pancake pan. I slightly lost it and immediately raised my voice to ask her what the heck she was doing. She gave me an attitude about how since I'm the jerk she's learning to cook by herself. I told her she can do that at her home and not in our kitchen. She smugly told me that it's not my decision to make because it's Brian's place as well. I told her it is my decision because everything in the kitchen is mine. When we moved in, the kitchen was empty apart from a single banged upon pan, one pot and three dull knives with plastic handles. The kitchen is now chef worthy. I dropped hundreds on appliances, cookware, nice dinnerware, etc. Brian is of course allowed to use everything in the kitchen. I told Cindy that she is not allowed to cook anything in our kitchen. Brian came into the kitchen at this point and diffused the argument. That was last week. Things between Brian and me are very awkward. Cindy has not been over yet. One of my friends absolutely went off on me, calling me a jerk because not everyone has the same opportunities. Side note, I grew up poor. I learned to cook on my own. I learned how to make great tasting meals out of ramen, hot dogs, rice, whatever was on clearance, etc. I don't think I'm the jerk for refusing to teach but I am wondering if banning her from the kitchen was a step too far. It's just that I really don't like her and honestly don't trust her not to damage something on purpose. Edit. The pan is fine. The coal that was supposed to become crepes protected the actual pan. Edit 2. Ah, this blew up a lot more than I thought. Join me in praying no one that knows about the situation sees this. I did not change enough details to have plausible deniability. To answer some questions, I already disliked Cindy prior to this because she was unfriendly to me since we met. Not saying hi back, glaring at me whenever I walked into the common area where she was, interrupting every conversation I had with Brian, etc. I love Brian, but I'm not in love with him. Do none of you have friends close enough they count as family? I also tried to bring up the situation with Brian again today and he full on flinched and shook his head. Thanks to people who suggested cooking something with a really delicious aroma when Cindy is over next time. You are all so petty. I love it. Not the jerk. You said no and she should have stopped asking after that. Cindy sounds like an entitled jerk. The metal spatula on a non-stick pan is utterly criminal. She's better off drinking the batter mix if she wants pancakes. 
Anyone using a metal spatula on a nonstick pan that doesn't belong to them would be banned from my house, not just my kitchen. Not the jerk. You do not mess with someone's cooking stuff. I just got a new set of Yakushi knives that I'm obsessed with. If someone was using them without my permission and using them incorrectly, I would flip my lid. Especially if they were acting as entitled as the girlfriend. Absolutely not the jerk. However, if you feel like sharing some sweet appliances you have that I need in my kitchen, I'm all ears. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you go ahead and teach her how to cook or not? Please let us know. I'd ban her from my place is what I'd do. Karen snoops through my house, so I hid embarrassing notes. I bought a house seven years ago and I met my fiance, Al, four years ago. This year, he moved in. We're talking about making it a home for both of us. But as of now, he hasn't moved much stuff in. Right now, 95% of the stuff and furniture in the house is mine. When his mom comes over, she's kind of a snoop. He was used to that, but when she comes to our house, it's so uncomfortable because she's just going through my stuff. When I'm bothered, she's like, I was just helping with chores, etc. He says I should just let her because she has a lot of nervous energy. One thing she snooped on was actually embarrassing. In my home office, I had a little affirmation post-it note on my monitor saying, I am smart, I am skilled, I am deserving of great things. It was a silly thing my therapist recommended to get me in a confident mindset before an interview. Anyway, she made a comment to me about my ego. But as a joke, I decided to do it again. I had my best friend come over and we got wine drunk and wrote a bunch of affirmations to hide. Some were, medicine cabinet, my teeth will regrow, I am shark-like and powerful, work desk, I will not just do my way to the top of the company, I will do my way to the top of the world. There were a bunch more and my friend and I had a hilarious time writing them. Next time my mother-in-law came over, she saw a few and she didn't acknowledge them to me even though she definitely started acting a little weird about me. I went to run some errands and when I was out, she confronted Al about the notes and was trying to tell him that I seemed unstable, egotistical and moving in was a bad idea. She showed him the notes and he didn't really know what to make of it. He asked me and I said that they were just some silly private notes to boost my self-confidence and make myself laugh. How had she gotten them? Has she been going through my things? He said she was just tidying and saw them and they were real weird. I was like, have you met me? You should know how weird I am. Anyway, if you don't want your mom seeing my weird stuff, you've got to stop letting her go through my crap. He asked if I left them on purpose to annoy her and I admitted that was kind of the joke but I also have other weird or private stuff, so what I said about her needing to stop snooping if she didn't want to find weird crap was still for real. He said I was making stuff hard for him. His mom was really protective and adjusting to him moving in with a girlfriend for the first time, and I was agitating her on purpose and making her think I wouldn't be a good partner when he wanted her to have the opposite impression of me. Am I the jerk for the note prank? Not the jerk. She's snooping through your home. I'd have gone further and left little notes like, nobody likes a snoop and you aren't welcome to go through my things but yours were pretty darn funny it's a red flag if your fiance stands up for her invading your privacy like this op yeah i feel so frustrated because he was okay with her doing it in his apartment because she actually would help with laundry and dishes and he appreciated that but in my house it's different because it's not his stuff there it's not even our stuff it's 95 percent my stuff because I've lived there for seven years and furnished it and bought everything. And he moved in after selling his furniture and only bringing a closet full of things and some gadgets. So when she's going through my house, it's not his stuff or even shared stuff. She's just going through my crap. And I'm not really cool with that because I don't want my guests helping with my laundry or looking for my dirty mugs. I think on the not funny side of things, I might just sit her down and say I've lived alone for six years. I live in a way that makes my home feel like a home. And part of that is not keeping anything but the living room and guest bathroom presentable for guests. So I'm uncomfortable with her as my guest going into the other rooms without asking or looking at my stuff. Unless you plan for your boyfriend's mom to move in soon and continue doing what she's doing now, I'd think about breaking up. 1. Your boyfriend is using her to do his share of the chores. This is not going to change. He's not going to start doing more chores of his own. He will always outsource his chores to his mom. 2. That means it is in his best interest to let his mom do whatever the heck she feels like doing, including moving in and taking over your home, life, and your kids, so he can relax and whatever. 3. When you have kids, you will be a married single parent, unless his mom moves in and co-parents with you. 4. 
again. He does not stand up to her and chooses her side against you when you point out how inappropriate he's being because it's in his best interests and that's not going to change. From everything I've seen, mama's boys don't change. So unless you plan to have your marriage to be between you, him, and his mom, I'd reevaluate. This is what I was going to say, though likely not as well. He's exhibiting failure to launch symptoms and it's clear that his mother is not prepared to let go. I think he was probably correct in saying he's not ready to move in. By his actions, he has demonstrated this. Not the jerk. Don't ask Al's mom to stop going through your stuff. Tell her she is not allowed to go through your stuff. Ever. If that doesn't sit well, maybe she won't come over anymore. Either way, you win. Need to resign because of sick leave? Sure. I used to work at a grocery store. It was in this smallish beachside community that had a lot of tourists and summer homes. Chose the store because they were all about finding long-term workers and had a little bonus and salary boost for those who finished the probationary period. I had just finished school and planned on taking a gap year, so it worked out well in my mind. I started about two months before summer and it was nice. We had a base of coworkers that worked well with each other, mostly middle-aged women and some pensioners. Found out quick that smoke break was for gossiping about the others and sometimes I took part when clients upset me or other coworkers usual daily things. I was told from day one that the manager didn't give a hoot about us because she was also manager at a bigger store. The rule was, if you had someone to cover you, it was fine to do whatever. Some took hour-long breaks, some drank during the job, but I was trying to make a good impression on my first job in that town, so I never did anything like that. Since I didn't have that much of a social life, I always changed shifts when someone needed, came in if someone was sick, even stocked the in shelves, which were the shift manager's job. When the pensioners asked in the middle of the day to change assignments because their back hurt from stocking, I was always okay with it. And they were really thankful. One of them, let's call her Lydia, was actually a neighbor and friends with my grandparents, so we used to hang out during lunch breaks and she even comforted me when I had a panic attack. We used to ride home together on our bikes if we finished together. She kind of took me under her wing and used to call me her work granddaughter. Things kind of took a turn once summer started. Usually it was about a 1,000 euros per two registers. Now it was suddenly 2,000 per one. They also hired summer workers who were three 16-year-old stock boys, one being the manager's son. Not to be an old-timer getting upset about the work ethic of the kids, but they were literally playing some tank games on their phones on the store floor while they had a cart of stuff that needed to be put out in front of them. Not to mention the not checking of dates Shoving old stuff in the back and new in the front, not checking if the barcode matched the price tag's barcode. What really upset me was that they didn't flush and went to the bathroom all over the toilet seats. Management made it my job to clean after them. I was told I couldn't say anything to call them out, so it became my everyday duty to clean the toilets, because the cleaner only came in the morning. Then the self-service checkouts came. I was the only cashier there when the builders put them in, so it became my duty to train the others including management and the two 60-plus-somethings. Lydia took it easy. The old man literally refused to learn. So now, every day, either me or Lydia had to be in store because the old man refused. It was also regular he came in drunk and drank at work. Also used to hit on me a lot, but I brushed it off. So, lots on my shoulders. Prep went down after I got my shot in the start of August. I had two days off. Figured I wouldn't get that sick because I had already had it. It was about a week or so before my probation period ended. So on Monday, I felt terrible and called in. My first time during this whole time I worked there. Called in with the manager. You have to come in. Lydia is on vacation and the only other one who knows is already sick and you didn't give us proper notice. Try to argue that I have a fever of 39 and feel like crap. No, you have to come in. So I get my crap together and go to work. Scrubbing the toilet with a fever. Dealing with customers with a fever. Yes, I took more breaks. Most coworkers asked me why I looked so bad and I told them that I was sick. End the day and go home. Next day, I feel even worse. Call in, say no, I'm putting my foot down, I can't come. First time I took a stand and said I can't destroy my health. Fine, you call Lydia and tell her. If she agrees, then you have to take sick leave. Okay, not really my job, but fine. Call her, wake her up, apologized profusely and told her the situation. She understood, wished me to feel better and hung up. 
I called my doctor and got on sick leave and then informed my manager. Went back to sleep. Got a call a few hours later. It's Lydia. You make everyone's lives so difficult here. Come in and give in your resignation. She isn't the manager. She's just a cashier like me. I asked, what the heck? And she told me they've been talking on the smoke break with all the shift managers and the main manager and apparently they decided I complained too much about my health and about other workers. I asked why my manager didn't call me. No real explanation. I said if the manager wants to fire me, she'd have to call me herself. No call. So two hours later, I call her myself. Ask what's going on. It's true. I need to resign my position. I ask why they don't just terminate me. I'm still on probation. Can't because you're on sick leave. Doesn't really make sense. During the probation period, they can fire me with no notice, no reasoning. I'm fuming at this time. Fine. I'll come in with my 39 degree fever. Got on my bike, pedaled the three kilometers. Everyone is giving me dirty looks. Manager gives me a filled out paper stating I quit on the day for personal reasons. I ask, so you can't fire me because I'm on sick leave? I need to resign? Manager says yes. It's too much paperwork to fire me. She doesn't have the time. Okay, deal. I take out a blank piece of paper, write my quitting date as of two weeks from now to, you know, be polite and give them the proper notice. Manager was fuming and argued I can't do that. I said that's the time frame I need to give according to my contract. She was too lazy to argue more. I signed the sheet and walked out, called my doctor the next morning and talked about my sick leave. A few days later, the manager calls me. Tomorrow is the big town fair. I'm definitely not sick anymore and can come in tomorrow. They are super short-staffed. I said that I'm on sick leave. She said I can't still be feeling crappy and I have to go into work right now. I told them no. My sick leave ends on day after my resignation date. She got super upset and said that if I didn't come to work, she'd have to be up on the register the whole day. To that, I just coughed fakely and said, well, have fun and hung up. Spent the two weeks on the beach on paid sick leave and also my probation lapsed, so they had to pay me the bonus. Edit. I did get my unemployment benefits with no problem and a well-paying job not soon after that. Never going back to that place. Thank you for all the support. Am I the jerk for bringing my own dinner to a wedding? Okay, okay, I know how it sounds. Please let me explain. I, 26 female, have a ton of medical issues, including some that create major dietary restrictions. Real dietary restrictions, not some random fad diet that has false positive benefits. My cousin, Kay, had her wedding a couple weeks ago and they did not have any menu items that I would be able to eat except a couple of the appetizers. Even then, I'm a little uncomfortable because they chose buffet style for the side dishes and catering creates a lot of opportunity for cross-contamination. I would never expect someone to change or add to their wedding menu on my behalf, so I messaged her as soon as we received the menu and just let her know that I would be unable to dine with them at the reception because of the dietary stuff and let her know that I would come back after I was able to eat. I understand what it was like leading up to a wedding and I received no response to my message though it was on Facebook and I knew she had opened it. I decided I would just put together a little lunchbox and leave it in the car so when I started to get hungry, I could just go grab a snack and come back in. Well, the reception came and all was well. Then dinner came and Kay came up to me and asked why I was leaving the venue. I told her that I just had to get some food in my belly and that I would be right back to finish celebrating. She got an appalled look on her face and asked why I would bring food to a wedding I knew would have some of the best. I let her know about the restrictions and reminded her about the message. She said, I just figured you were being dramatic and someone in the family would get you under control. Guess nobody could. My jaw hit the floor. I wish that my restrictions could be casually broken, but unfortunately I get quite ill if I break the food boundary. It is well known within my family that this is true. I've ruined a holiday or two by accidentally eating contaminated food. Anyway, I really didn't know how to respond, so I just walked out to the car and had my food with the company of the car radio. I am the queen of being hangry, so I hoped that getting fed would help me to get a better grip on the situation, but I was still shaky mad. I came back in prepared to sit quietly and get through the rest of the night without too much more to say, but my aunt and uncle came to the table and told me how much I had hurt Kay's feelings by bringing my own food. I explained, although I still feel a certain sort of way about having to explain, the restrictions again 
and told them I tried to be as polite as humanly possible by reaching out beforehand and leaving my snacks out of sight of the reception guests. They told me it gave the whole wedding a bad look, and if it was really that big of a deal, then I needed to eat beforehand. Nobody else has really weighed in, and at this point, I don't really know if I was in the wrong. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. If it were my wedding and a cousin sent me that message, I'd have told you to go ahead and bring in your food so you don't even have to leave. But cousin and her family believe OP's medical issues are fake and that she uses them to be dramatic. Dramatic people don't quietly handle a need in a way that causes no disruption. Dramatic people make everything about them, blow things out of proportion, and involve others in their crusade. Cousin and her family are the ones who are dramatic. Not the jerk. It's actually hugely considerate of you to bring your own food and not bug the bride with having to create a dish just for you. I had to work around a few minor food restrictions and it was a nightmare to deal with the venue. I have no idea why the bride is angry. You affected no one with your decision. Take solace in the fact that you were considerate and kind. Not the jerk. You were discreet about it by sitting in your car to eat. Unlike one I read on here once, where a guest got fast food delivered to a wedding and ate it in front of the other guests. Alternatively, if you are invited to another event, feel free to eat contaminated food and leave Kay with the lovely memories of the after effects as a result, possibly by throwing up on the dance floor or perhaps being carted off in an ambulance. Your aunt and uncle needed to wind their necks in too and stop indulging your cousin being a bridezilla. Am I the jerk for no longer bringing dinner for my wife after she claimed I never cook? I work at a nice restaurant as a cook and every day when I get off from work, I always cook dinner for my wife and our two kids, who are 8 and 6, at the restaurant before coming home. The only time I don't cook for them are on weekends when I'm off, and that's when my wife does the cooking. We usually trade off who makes breakfast and lunch for the kids every other day, but for the week, I'm always the one bringing home dinner. Weekends, we sometimes get together with friends, and they come over to our house. My wife usually cooks, and I help set the table and clean afterwards. One of her friends, Stacy, asked how come I never do any of the cooking and it's always on my wife all the time taking meals for the kids, especially when I'm a cook myself. Instead of correcting her, she sort of laughed and went along with it, making jokes about, you know how it is. And Stacy laughed because her ex-husband was the same way and then sort of ripped on me in a joking way about how I better get myself sorted out before I become an ex too. My wife just said, well, let's see if he actually listens and starts cooking for once joking about all the time I spend in the kitchen at work but won't do the same at home. It really upset me. I'm not the husband that just doesn't do anything after I'm home from work. I cook food for her and the kids at work and on top of that, I make separate dishes for each of them, what she wants and what the kids want. All that after standing on my feet all day. We talked about it once they left because I don't appreciate being told I'm not doing something she knows for a fact I do. She didn't want to apologize for it because it was all just meant to be a funny joke. Even after telling her about how it hurt my feelings being put down like that, my wife said she felt like she has to go along with the joke so there wouldn't be any awkward vibes, whatever that means. But I said, fine, if she can't apologize for something that was mean just so she could laugh along with her friends, then I won't keep doing something she already claims I won't do. For the past week, I've only brought home dinner for our kids and she's had to make her own food. She's mad that I'm refusing to feed her over what happened instead of letting it go but I can't help but feel mad about being made fun of like that when I'm busting my tail to provide for my family and still making sure they have enough food on the table every evening. She just thinks I'm the jerk for how I'm reacting when she's already tired at the end of the day, but still having to make food for herself. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Your wife missed a great opportunity to boast on you, all for acceptance by others who have nothing invested in your relationship. OP. Not even to boast. It would have felt nice though, but at least say, Hey, you're wrong, not just go along with it. As a stay-at-home mom who has a significant other who actually does things for himself and around the house, I've basically had this conversation before. All she had to say is, actually, I don't have that problem. He's a responsible adult and pulls his share. I don't get why she had to lie to keep it from being awkward. I'm sure it was awkward already. Not the jerk. Your spouse is supposed to be your partner in everything in life. The person who always has your back, like you always have theirs. She threw you directly under the bus for the sake of not creating waves with her friend. Then, when you told her you didn't find her comments at all funny and quite hurtful that she let someone else believe you're a deadbeat, she blew you off. So, she can make her own dinner until she sincerely apologizes 
and acknowledges that your contribution to the family of cooking dinner during the week is important. Am I the jerk for causing my sister to no longer have college paid for? I'm 16, female. My sister is 18. Her name is May and she's going to college next year. She applied early, decision to a prestigious school she's always wanted to go to and she got in. When she applied and when she got in, our mother had said that she would be paying for my sister's college expenses. She can afford to completely pay for what May's college fund doesn't cover. Our father cannot and May would have to take out student loans. Our parents are split. May chose to live solely with our father. I split time between their houses. May heavily dislikes our mother, but she is polite to her because she wants her college paid for. She's very rude about our mother behind her back. A few days ago, May had gotten off the phone with our mother and was ranting to our father about how insufferable she is and how she hates her and she wishes she didn't have to talk to her because she's an awful person and that she only tolerates her so she'll pay for her college. I was in the next room and took a video of this and sent it to our mother. She must have said something to May because May was very upset with me. She said I had no right to record her without her consent and that I was invading her privacy and she should be able to rant in her own home without worrying about being recorded. She said that our mother had said she no longer would be paying for her college and I was ruining her life and that I was making it so much harder for her when she had worked so hard to get accepted. My father is also mad at me, but my mother is glad I told her so she can know. I didn't think I was in the wrong at the moment because I thought it was the right thing to do, but now I'm thinking I should have just minded my own business. Am I the jerk? Everyone sucks here. Your sister is a jerk for exploiting someone that they cannot stand. You're the jerk for recording a private conversation and sharing it with others. I think you wanted this to happen and that you really do not like your sister. So I see many posters focusing on the non-consent of the recording. Well, that's a legal question in my opinion, not a jerk one. Some places permit one party consent for recording. Other person doesn't need to be informed. Others don't and it's illegal. But in any place on earth, for the most part, you are allowed to see and hear your environment and those around you, and it is your freedom to take notes, recount the events to others, etc. OP didn't lie, and her sister is awful. I would want to know if I were expressing generosity to someone if they actually thought I was less than dirt and cared only about appearing to placate me while later badmouthing. I don't want to support leeches like that. OP did the right thing here in every moral sense, and I have zero sympathy for the thankless, entitled jerk of a sister. Too bad. No, she did not. It was an absolutely sleazy and mean move, and her sister vented after an argument phone call out of emotion. She should have spoken to her first and asked her about the reasons for the negative feelings towards their mother. Everyone sucks here. You acted like a snitch, and your sister is a dishonest, opportunistic brat. Not the jerk. She was using your mother for her money. You didn't ruin her life. She did. Your mother deserved to know rather than be shocked and hurt when your sister cut off all contact when she was finished with school. ETA, because I see this brought up a lot. We don't know what was on that tape. We don't know what goes on behind the scenes, as people keep pointing out. You know who does? Mom. And she made a decision based on those facts. 1. This sub is about voting on the information we have, not speculating on what might have happened. 2. Mom has a right to make her own decisions. 3. If OP was truly the golden child and horrible to her sister and mom's favorite, like a lot of people think, would mom be paying for non-golden child, the sister's, college fund in the first place? Probably not. 4. Paying for her own college isn't ruining her life. Plenty of people take out loans and manage to pay them off. 5. Being a parent doesn't stop when they rebel, turn 18. No, no it doesn't. But unfortunately, college is not considered a necessity, but a choice. So as a legal adult, sister is responsible for it. 6. College is too expensive for the kid to pay. See number 4. Do I think college should be free? Yes, but it isn't, and wishing won't change it. Am I the jerk for interrupting my ex-husband's birthday and taking my daughter home because she was there without permission? Me, female 35, and my ex-husband, male 37, got separated one year ago. We share custody of our 15-year-old daughter. My ex-husband has her for certain days and his birthday didn't fall on one of these days. In fact, it fell on one of the days where my daughter is supposed to be with me. He called me so we could discuss letting him have my daughter on the day of his birthday, but I told him no because it's not his day to have her. He got my daughter involved and she said she really wants to go, but I said no because I have my reasons. My ex-husband dropped it, but on the day of his birthday, I went to pick my daughter up from school 
but I discovered that he came and took her straight to the restaurant where his birthday party was taking place. I was fuming. I called him, but he didn't pick up. I then called my daughter, and she said yes, she was with him. I used location feature to track her phone and got the address. I showed up and interrupted the party. My ex-husband started arguing with me, but I told him he had no permission to have my daughter with him that day, but he said my daughter wanted to be there for his birthday. My former mother-in-law tried to speak to me, and I told her to stay out of it, then told my daughter to grab her stuff, because we're going home. My ex-husband and family unloaded on me, and I tried to ignore them and just leave, but my daughter made it hard for me. I took her home eventually and grounded her for agreeing to leave school with her dad when it wasn't his day. Her dad called me yelling about how bitter and spiteful I was to deprive my daughter from attending his birthday. I told him it's basic respect and boundaries, but he claimed it was just me being spiteful and deliberately hurtful towards him that I didn't even care how it affected my daughter. I hung up, but more of his family members are starting to blast me on social media saying I showed up and made a scene at the restaurant, went as far as calling me unstable. You're the jerk. You should have let him have her on the birthday. Why make such a big deal? Yes, your ex shouldn't have picked her up after you said no to the switch, but once he did, you should have left her and dealt with it afterwards. All you're accomplishing now is alienating your daughter. She's 15 and enjoying her time with her dad. Letter. Also, no one seems to care that she used apps to track her daughter. Massive invasion of privacy? She's 15. When I was 15, I had to be home by 10 and let my mom know where I was. But beyond that, I was pretty free. Like, would you stop her from going to a friend's house because it's your night? A lot of parents don't believe in a kid's right to privacy. It's sickening. Edit for clarity. I'm referring to parents who believe a kid has no right to privacy to fulfill a power fantasy. I disagree. She's 15 and legally still the parent's responsibility. There's nothing wrong with using location tracking to figure out where your minor kid is if you need to. Of course it's wrong to tag your kid like a migrating antelope. If you have no idea where your kid is, you're a bad parent. And if you solve that problem with a tracking device, you're a lazy parent who's going to raise sneaky kids. Try talking to your kids and teaching them how to be safe when they aren't in your eye line like every other generation of parent has done. My daughter expects me to pay for her boyfriend's meal. I'm a mother of a 24-year-old daughter, Christine. Christine moved back to our hometown after obtaining her college degree and met her current boyfriend, Simon, who's 30. I'm not a big fan of Simon, but we're civil enough to be around each other. The other day, I called Christine to invite her for lunch and she agreed to come. Unbeknownst to me, she brought Simon with her. I was slightly bothered, but only since I was looking for an ordinary mother and daughter lunch to catch up with stuff. I welcomed her and Simon, and as far as ordering food, I ordered the usual for Christine, but Simon went over the menu and picked many things, including a drink. Now, this didn't bother me, because I figured that he would be paying for this stuff, but apparently, this was not the case. The bill came, and I told Simon and Christine that I was only paying for myself and Christine. Simon asked why was that, and I told him because I didn't invite him. He let out a loud, Come on now, what? And Christine asked if I was serious. I told her yes, because I only invited her, didn't I? She then said I was being rude and unwelcoming to Simon after he took the time to drop what he was doing and come join us, but I frankly told her this wasn't what I planned. She got offended and said they're both one, and I should either pay for both of them or not pay at all. I told her this was not fair to both her and I, but she said no, this was unfair to Simon. I asked if he had money to pay, and he shook his head no. I apologized and still stuck to paying for myself and Christine, but she refused to let me, saying I either pay for both or not pay at all. I asked if that is what she really wanted and she nodded. I said, okay then, paid for myself and left. Clearly, Christine had no money as well and they had to wait for a friend to pay for them at the restaurant and Christine was upset about that. She called me and said that I not only disrespected Simon and made him feel unwelcome, but I also bailed on them by only paying for myself and leaving them stuck in a horrible situation begging for a friend to help. She said she's hurt, Simon's hurt, and they expect an apology and the money their friend paid since it's a debt they need to return now. I told her it was her doing for bringing an uninvited person with her, then insisting that I pay for them both or not pay at all. She argued that I was trying to avoid responsibility and I should make it up to them if I care about our relationship, but I said it won't happen because I don't owe them anything. Things got worse between us. Now I'm thinking I might have caused this by not paying for both of them. 
Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Stick to your guns. He was unwelcome because he wasn't invited. Who doesn't bring their wallet when they weren't even invited? Even if he was a welcome addition, it's very rude to just expect and then demand that someone pay for your food. These two people are too old for these antics and both sound like moochers who need to grow up. A relationship doesn't mean that if someone is willing to treat one person that they automatically have to foot the bill for both. Edit. Based on OP's comments, this guy is unemployed and sounds like he only showed up for a free meal or in an attempt to ensure that his girlfriend and OP couldn't have a private conversation. The nerve of some people. Even when I'm invited, I always bring my wallet and we always end up fighting to pay the bill. I don't know how people can go around feeling and acting like entitled jerks. Not the jerk, OP. They are. Especially at 30 years old. What 30-year-old adult can't pay for his own lunch? He's 30, not 13. This boggles my mind. And he's also got the nerve to be upset and ask someone else to pay for it. And OP's daughter is 24 and still expects mom to pay for her lunch? What? It wasn't really clear to me by this story, but I got the impression mom asked to take daughter out to lunch. So if that's the case, I would expect someone, especially someone who might still be adjusting to a new job and moving and paying off student loans and so on, might not necessarily have funds to go out to lunch at any given moment. But if her mom told her she was taking her out, it would be entirely reasonable to agree to that, knowing she couldn't afford that normally. Bringing Simon along unannounced and uninvited is where things went sideways. Christine doesn't seem to have a sense of social consideration, and obviously Simon sounds completely worthless. Reconsider working here if I want to take a honeymoon? Okay. I had a manager who hated reading emails and would miss important issues and meetings because of it. I even suggested text-to-speech to make it less unpleasant, but he told me off. He spent a lot of time playing golf with clients and was mostly inaccessible. It got to the point where most of the team CC'd me. I was next on the totem pole, so I could grant approvals for stuff like expense reports and help out on projects my manager was supposed to work on. When I was getting married, I requested three weeks off for my honeymoon. Everyone knew I was getting married. Manager even congratulated me on the engagement when it happened. I had five weeks vacation accumulated and didn't think it would be a big deal, especially since I was requesting it nearly eight weeks in advance. Then a vacation request denied email comes in from our time off system. I emailed manager following up, left voicemails, and after a week, he finally replied to an email. Look, we need dedicated people. If you think you can take three weeks off for a vacation, you need to reconsider your position here. Keep in mind, my request stated, vacation request for honeymoon. I replied with, no consideration needed. My last day will be in three weeks. Let me know about transitioning duties. I forwarded this to HR, CCing manager, and HR sets up my exit interview. But HR tells my manager to set up transition for my responsibilities. During my notice period, I even replied all to this email twice, asking about transition plans, since I didn't get any transition plan. I tell my team, they ask manager what to do with my duties, and manager says he'll think about it, but doesn't do anything nor email anything out. Four weeks later, I get a call from my old boss. Are you planning on coming in this week? Why would I? Because you work for me. Not as of last week. Stop messing around. Get your butt in the office. I told you my last day when you denied my vacation request. How about giving proper notice and transitions? HR asked you to develop a transition plan and to attend my exit interview. It's not my fault you don't read all your emails. I hang up and block his number, but screenshot the call log and send it to the HR contact with an innocent, should I be worried? Old manager still thinks I work for him. Fallout. Things went from bad to worse for my old manager. Apparently, I was doing most of his managerial duties so he actually had to try and get stuff done himself. He also got into some legal issues. Those client golf outings? He played golf, but not with clients. That made his termination with cause, so no severance for him. I ended up at a competitor with a nice bump in pay. I wanted to start after my honeymoon, but new company really wanted my help on a pitch. I joined for several weeks, reworking about one third of the pitch, and then went on my honeymoon for three weeks. They paid me for the entire time off. That garnered a lot of goodwill from both me and my wife. I only left the company because Mrs. and I moved cross country and they didn't have remote positions back then. I don't have all the details, but I know old manager had to hire lawyers to deal with legal issues related to his dismissal and the expenses. 
Clarification. This happened in the late 2000s. Mrs. and I are still married. Am I the jerk for not giving my dad's girlfriend my change? I, 17 male, came to visit my dad for the weekend. His girlfriend, Tessa, doesn't live with him, but is here all the time, and she has a kid. We all went out to dinner yesterday and stopped at Walmart after. I found a movie that I wanted, so I bought it and used cash. Tessa's daughter got some candy and gave her mom the change. I didn't think anything of it and figured her mom kept her money. I bought my movie with money I got from working. It's not like my dad gave it to me or it was allowance or anything. When we were leaving, Tessa asked me if she could have my change. I said, what? No, and looked at my dad. She said, not the singles, just the change, because I need quarters for the laundry mat. I said, no, I saved my change, sorry. I thought that was the end of it. Then later, my dad talked to me while we were outside. He said that I come off as stingy and should have just given Tessa my change. She has to use the laundry mat, and it's not even a dollar I'd be giving her. I said, well, it's kind of weird for her to be asking a kid that's not even her kid for money. He said, again, it's not even a dollar. She's been having a hard time getting quarters. I said, I have a whole change jar at mom's. I can go get it. He said, and give it to her? I said, no, I'll count it out and she can buy the change from me. I usually cash it in at the bank anyways. He said, never mind. I just thought you could give her the change from earlier. Be the bigger person. You're lucky you have it so good and don't have to pay to do laundry. I do my laundry at home, not his house anyways. Today, Tessa kept making comments about how she's glad she taught her daughter to share and not be entitled. I don't have a problem with giving her the 75 cents, if even that, but I feel like then, every time I'm over and buy something or get change, I'll be expected to hand it over to her. Am I the jerk for not giving my dad's girlfriend my quarters? Not the jerk. It's weird for an adult to be asking a kid for money, and even weirder that she's harping on it so much. If your dad is so concerned about her laundry situation, why doesn't he let her do it at his house? OP. Apparently, he offered. She said no because she doesn't want to feel like she's taking advantage. So she just takes advantage of you instead? Cool. Not the jerk. I am very embarrassed for Tessa. I mean, they were all right there in the Walmart parking lot. She could have asked a cashier for change for bills when her daughter was paying for her candy. I feel sorry for OP. This is a really weird dynamic. Raised her kid to share and not be entitled? Yet she herself feels entitled enough to get the change from your hard-earned money? She might want to think about that a little more if she can't see the hypocrisy. Not the jerk at all. Dad's girlfriend needs to do some self-reflection. Not the jerk. Your money, your rules. If you feel like giving it to her, good for you, and vice versa. I don't know what your father was talking about when he said, be the bigger person, when in fact you were standing up for yourself. Your dad's girlfriend shouldn't have to rely on kids to provide for her, she needs to act like an adult. Also very childish and petty of her to make those comments about her kid that were directed towards you. Boss, just do your job. Me, as you wish. I work at a tech company and my official job is fairly simple and I find that I have free time decently often. My unofficial extra jobs used to be monitoring the morale level in the office and doing things to bring up said morale. Tech support on the computers in the office so IT doesn't have to deal with it mostly because I'm faster than they are at getting things going again, assuming the problem isn't hardware related and often enough helping out other departments when I have the time. A promotion comes up, I apply for it. The boss gives it to someone who had only been hired a few months ago. I was annoyed by this because I had been working there for much longer and my evaluations are always glowing. Another promotion comes up, I get denied again in favor of another person who's only been there for a few months. Three more promotions come and go and my boss always gives the new people the promotions. At this point, several people who have been hired around the same time I have all quit to seek opportunity elsewhere, and many of the people who got promoted also quit because they used their promotion to get a better job somewhere else. Also, the boss likes to send an email with a BS canned denial letter with some official reason as to why you were not selected. I eventually decide to confront my boss about it, so I just bluntly ask, what am I doing wrong? Why are people who have been recently hired getting promotions over me? The boss couldn't answer. He stumbles and stutters for about two minutes, like the sniveling pencil neck he is. Eventually just blurts out, Look, you don't have much experience in dealing with people below you, and I really need you to just do your job. All right, as you wish. 
Now, anytime someone asks me if I can get their computer, monitor, printer, etc. working properly again, I tell them to ask tech support. My bi-weekly delivery of homemade confections has come to an end, and I no longer lift a finger to help other departments, even when I do have the extra time. Tech support can take a surprisingly long time to get around to our department. Something I could have done in 10 minutes, it will take them an hour or more. It's also a three-person department in a fairly large office building. My boss pulls me into his office a while back and asked me if I have a problem. I told him I don't have a problem. He then reminds me of all the things that I used to do that I suddenly don't do anymore, then makes the mistake of asking me why I suddenly stopped. I told him that none of those were part of my job description and that I only did those things as a courtesy. But since he told me just do my job and strongly hinted that I am to go no further in the company, I'm going to just do what is part of my official job description from now on. He went from having a smug grin on his face, ready to tear into me for my sudden change in demeanor, to realizing that he can't say a darn thing because he knows that he can't order me to do anything outside of my official job description and that he did himself and his entire department over by basically telling me to shut up and get back to work. Am I the jerk for folding down the pages of a book my friend let me borrow? I, 20 male, am taking a modern literature class this semester for my general education requirements and I had to buy like 14 novels for it. My university's bookstore didn't have the option to rent them and I didn't want to spend a lot of money on buying books I'm not planning on ever reading again. I asked my friend, who is an English major and has probably at least every book known to man, if she had any of the books I needed and she pretty much had all of the ones that were required. She had taken a more advanced version of the same course, more advanced because it was for actual English majors and not students trying to get through their gen eds. I asked if I could borrow them for the semester and she agreed. I started reading the first one and when I would finish at a certain point, I would bend down the top corner of the page just a little so I could remember where my place was. I didn't think this was a really bad thing. I've always seen this done with books if you don't have a bookmark and once you pick it back up, you put the paper back in place and it's fine. I was studying on campus one day and I ran into my friend. She came and sat down next to me and we were talking and just chilling and then all of a sudden she sees the book I'm currently reading for class, one of the ones she gave me, and starts freaking out, asking why I bent the corners down. I told her it was just to keep my place and she starts going through all the corners that I had bent down and put back up like, look, I can see here and here. And honestly, I thought it was a little dramatic. I understand she likes to keep her books in good condition, but she didn't say I couldn't when she lent them to me. And some of the books even have annotations in them from when she read them. So it's not like the books are in mint condition. When I told my friend this, she just got even more upset and said I should have known and that it is common sense not to put the pages down. I apologized for not knowing, but she wouldn't hear it. She told me she wanted all of her books back and I tried to tell her that I would use a bookmark from now on, but she wouldn't listen at all. Now I have to spend over $100 on some books that will just get tossed or donated after this semester is over. Edit. I've heard you guys loud and clear. Yes, I have bad book manners. Yes, I'm dumb for doing it and not realizing. And I will apologize again and I will be replacing the book I ruined. Lesson learned. I didn't even know what dog earring was until the comments replying to this post. Again, thanks for the feedback. I accept the jerk status. Also, DA status along with it. I probably will not be replying to very many people from here on out just because the sheer amount of activity that this post has gotten in the last hour alone is very difficult to keep up with, but I do get the gist of it and I promise I have learned my lesson. Edit. For those of you saying, have you seriously never read a book or not understanding how I don't like to read, I understand that if it's something you really like, it's difficult to understand why someone else doesn't do it. I listen to audiobooks and such, but personally, I find it difficult to read. And no, I will not be elaborating on that. Just understand that not everyone can physically enjoy some things like others do. I get I was dumb, and I understand this post makes me sound dumb, but I would appreciate if those kinds of comments stopped. A lot of people don't know what it feels like growing up having difficulties doing something that other people can do extremely well. I am stupid, but I'm not stupid because I don't read or that I have difficulties with reading. Again, I'm sorry that I ruined my friend's book and I will be apologizing. Final edit. My friend reached out to me and apologized to me, which I wasn't expecting. She said she felt bad and that she talked to a few friends about it and calmed down and wanted to talk it out. She said she realized that she understood I might have been confused since she said I was allowed to use the book for class 
take notes and annotate inside, but not obscure the text obviously. And I also apologized for how I acted, and I offered to replace the book I had ruined. She agreed, and also said I can use the books again as long as I promise to use a bookmark from now on. So, I think the whole situation kind of worked itself out after things cooled down. I'm also going to be completely honest that I posted this hoping for some perspective and got something else entirely. I've never posted on a huge forum like this, and this is the first time that I have ever really felt like social media was bad for my mental health, like truly. I'm not really proud to admit it, but some of these comments really had me reliving my middle and high school days, and that stuff was never fun, honestly. Thank you to everyone who gave me feedback, especially those who didn't care about sparing feelings and told me how it is, without making any comments on learning disabilities or neurodivergence. I understand a lot more now, and you're right. I was disrespectful of someone else's property, and I'm very grateful my friend is willing to forgive me. You're the jerk. Don't even need to read it. You disrespected and ruined her property. Buy her a new one, you selfish jerk. Give your friend the new books you now need to purchase and keep the dog-eared ones. Just hope that none of them had special meaning to the friend. OP saying that this is normal procedure when you don't have a bookmark had me laughing. Because who the heck doesn't have a bookmark? Literally anything is a bookmark. The receipt you still keep in your wallet, bookmark, a dollar note, or any other currency for that matter, bookmark. The packaging of literally anything that isn't food, bookmark. I would say there is no way OP didn't have a better option. You're the jerk. Have you never heard of bookmarks? Heck, you could have even put a folded piece of paper or a post-it note to know where you stopped reading. A piece of tissue, scrap paper, a string, there's literally no reason you'd have to fold down the corners of a borrowed book. I sometimes fold down the corners of my own books because I don't personally think it's a big deal, but OP is definitely the jerk in this situation. Yes, you're the jerk here. It wasn't your book and bending corners is considered damage. Next time you borrow someone else's book, use a bookmark. A person you've borrowed something from shouldn't have to tell you to return it in the same condition they lent it to you in. Am I the jerk for not leaving my sister-in-law's wedding venue when asked to? I know it sounds terrible, but please let me explain. My husband's sister recently got married and her wedding venue was a large estate where guests stayed overnight. It's about three hours away from home. When I got there, I realized that one of her bridesmaids was a childhood bully. I had no idea they knew each other since my sister-in-law didn't do any bridal parties where I would have seen photos. I honestly had no idea they knew each other at all, especially since I'm not close to sister-in-law. My relationship with my bully, I'll call her Laura, was horrible and messed me up for a long time. Our mothers were friends in a small, tight-knit community, and I was essentially the punching bag for the entire group of girls. The final straw was when Laura spread a rumor that I hooked up with a bunch of guys in our group, something that's a big deal in our community, and even went as far as to fake a dirty text message string with one of the guys and posted it online. In a moment of weakness and frustration, I retaliated by posting a crap ton of screenshots where she and the girls were horrible to me. Things like them calling me Miss Piggy, and saying that hanging out with me was like charity work. I tagged everyone from their parents and family members to just friends who would know them. The post blew up and it definitely impacted her social life. She was also apparently punished severely by her parents. This all happened during college, but I don't know the full extent since we all cut contact with each other. Back to the present, Laura noticed me at the reception and just lost it. She blamed me for ruining her life and called me a vindictive jerk in front of everyone. At that point, sister-in-law got involved and said I was ruining her wedding for causing Laura's outburst and asked me to leave. I was willing to leave the reception and go back to my room, but Laura said she couldn't stand to even be in the same space as me and insisted that I go home. Even if I wanted to, it wasn't like I could just leave. We were three hours away from home and I came in one car with my husband and our three kids. I didn't feel comfortable driving at night by myself with the kids and I couldn't just leave all three of them with my husband to figure out a carpool situation with another guest. They're all super young too and require a lot of attention. My mother-in-law and father-in-law stepped in and said Laura was out of line and that I was family, but sister-in-law said that if I didn't leave, she'd never forgive me for ruining her special day. I ended up staying because I couldn't figure out a good way to leave and manage a ride for my husband and kids. It's been three weeks and sister-in-law is still giving me the cold shoulder. My husband told me to just ignore her, but she's upset enough to be posting about how horrible her night was on social media. She hasn't named me directly, but I still feel terrible. Not the jerk. Bullies and bully sympathizers deserve everything they get. 
I would go so far as to call sister-in-law a bully as well. Birds of a feather and all that, eh? Not the jerk. I wonder if sister-in-law already knew the story about OP, albeit from Laura's point of view. I mean, it's weird that sister-in-law and Laura just happened to be close friends and sister-in-law took her side so quickly. So back in the day, you called out your bully to defend yourself. She got consequences for her actions, and now years later, she still thinks she did nothing wrong and wants you out of the wedding of your sister-in-law? I don't see how you can be the jerk here, especially since there isn't really a way for you to go back to your place. All I'm hearing is, am I the jerk for properly defending myself against a nightmarish woman who created terrible lies about me? And the answer is no, not the jerk. Am I the jerk for moving now that my son no longer wants to live with me? I, 37 female, share a son, Timmy, who's 13, with my ex, John, who's 37. We split up when Tommy was a toddler, so he lived full-time with me, and then it was 50-50 when he was around 8. During my first year of marriage, John received a job offer back in his home state. We live in the USA, Midwest, and I initially didn't want to go, but John eventually wore me down. I never really liked where we lived and would often talk to John about possibly moving again. But since we were in his home state and he had family here, John never wanted to discuss it. When we were in the middle of a divorce, the idea of me and Tommy moving away was brought up and John freaked out, saying that I had no right to take away his son and I was hounded by his side of the family. Tommy is literally the only reason why I still lived where I did and I always hated the weather and missed my friends. Before lockdown, Tommy approached me about living with his dad full time and when I asked him why, and he assured me it wasn't anything about me or where we were living, just that at his dad's place he had more room. John made more money than me and lived in a four-bedroom house while I had a two-bedroom townhouse. I won't lie and say that I was a little sad at the idea of seeing my son less, but I wasn't going to stop him if he wanted to go. It was agreed that Tommy would spend a weekend a month, spring break, and summers with me while John and I alternated holidays. A while back, an old friend reached out and it was a great reconnecting. It wasn't long until we found out we worked for the same company. It's a nationwide firm that has multiple offices across the country, and my friend offered to give me a recommendation for a new position that I was trying to apply for. I was grateful and said that I didn't get the job, but a week later, I was surprised when the firm offered me another position that paid more money and offered more benefits. It was also back in my home state, so I would get to be near my family again. I immediately said yes, and when Tommy came to visit me, I told him about the job and asked him if there was anything he wanted to keep while the rest of his stuff would just come with me. Tommy asked why I would want to move, and aside from the money, I told him that I never really liked living here and was always planning on leaving once he turned 18 and graduated high school. Tommy seemed to take the news well, but his dad called me furious and said I was manipulative because our son now thinks that I'm punishing him for wanting to live with his father full time. Am I the jerk? Edit to add, sorry, had to step away for a bit, but after seeing some comments and messages, I wanted to clear up a few things. 1. John and I were married when we moved to the Midwest. 2. I never tried to move with Tommy, I just brought this up as a possibility during the divorce. 3. After the divorce, I focused mostly on Tommy, so I never had another relationship after the divorce, so there's no significant other. 4. I haven't formally accepted the position yet and have until the end of the week to do so. 5. If I do accept the position, I wouldn't leave until around the end of March because I'm assisting with a project. 6. On paper, I still have 50-50 custody and the visitation arrangement is just a verbal agreement John and I have because we didn't want to have to pay for lawyers. 7. The current visitation is set up the way it is, mostly because John and I sat down together and asked Tommy what he wanted. 8. Tommy has been living full-time with his dad for a little over a year now. 9. If and when I move, of course, I would still have contact with my son. I don't know where people are getting that I would stop talking to him just because I live in another state. 10. I know everyone's situation is different, but John and I don't have the type of co-parenting relationship where either one of us can just stop by, so the dinner every night isn't a thing. Not the jerk. Sometimes it's necessary to move for a job. Plus, there are custody schedules that will give you plenty of time with your son during school vacations. You are respecting his choice to live with his dad full time. Your ex is out of line for criticizing you. I think the ex has more of a problem with her moving than the son. Probably worried that the kid will like her new home more or something. More money equals potentially larger than former house with parent he grew up with. Not the jerk. 
Your ex-husband locked you in a place where you had no support and no family, refused to talk about moving back, and refused to let you take his son. You're not married anymore. He can't tell you where you can and can't go. Tell your son it's not his fault at all. You got a job position in this state and will make better money. Tell him he's welcome to come visit you and hopefully you'll be able to afford a bigger place too. Tell your ex to buzz off and take his unwanted opinions with him. Karen's stepdaughter expects me to pay for her college. I set her straight. I met my partner Madison five years ago. Madison has a daughter from her ex named Allie, who's 17, and I have a 15-year-old son from my previous relationship. They are both with us full time. I would say since the first week we started dating that Allie never liked me. I've tried to bond with her, extending an olive branch to being able to simply coexist, but it's uneasy at best. She tells her mom the reason she dislikes me so much is because her mother moved in with me and moved away from her dad. They moved half an hour away with traffic. Madison is unable to work many jobs. She has a felony on her record. She was mailing high-priced bottles of bourbon across state lines at 23 and has a god-awful back that lays her up days at a time. With that said, I handle the expenses, which isn't a problem. I'm an engineer with a high wage and overtime is limitless if I want it. Allie makes life difficult when she can. She mocks me to my face, refuses to do chores, breaks into my wine cellar, and lately has been making fun of me with her dad via Facebook and Twitter. They enjoy calling me a nerd and a loser because I play Dungeons and Dragons, and I guess because I'm basically different. Everyone can see what they say about me on there, and it's embarrassing to say the least. Her mother stands up for me and tries to control it, but it doesn't last. Allie's dad isn't a saint, even though she thinks he is. He's in and out of trouble, can't hold a steady job, and he still lives with his mom. I'm not trying to be harsh on the guy here, but at least here it's anonymous, which is better than he gives me on Facebook. Recently, Allie has been jumping through the hoops of college applications and she and her mother sat down to discuss options and whatnot. Allie isn't a great student, but she isn't terrible either. She's not going to get many, if any at all, scholarships or grants. Madison asked me about tuition and I said I would match Allie's dad dollar for dollar. They kind of stared at me for a minute until my son broke the tension with a laugh and said, well, that might cover the gas to drop her off. I asked him to leave the kitchen and he did. However, my wife was livid and Allie was on the verge of crying. Allie left the kitchen and my girlfriend said that was out of line and cruel for an adult to say that to someone her age. I shot back with, well, someone needed to set her straight and you or her father weren't doing it and now she will see her dad for what he really is. Guys, I'm tired of it. I didn't do anything to this girl and I really tried to be there for her. I don't deserve to be treated like this, especially in my own home. I'm just tired of it all. I'm thinking of just ending it with Madison so I can be rid of Allie. I really love Madison, but her daughter should come first for her, and it's getting to a point where she's dead last for me. Am I the jerk for my remarks? Mother-in-law rearranges all of my stuff. I went interstate to see my mother over the Christmas break. I had asked my boyfriend to look after my cat and house sit for me while I was away. I said to him not to have anyone over, which included mother-in-law. I think that's a pretty reasonable request. While I was away, boyfriend secretly had mother-in-law over to my house under the guise of meeting the cat. Mother-in-law got it in her head that I needed her to tidy up, so they set to work tidying up while I was gone. I asked boyfriend not to get too carried away and not to touch anything that could be classed as rearranging. I thought I made myself very clear on my stance about this. Boyfriend actively lied to me about not having anyone over while I was away. I came home. Boyfriend picks me up from the airport to tell me that my father is coming to my flat to see me. I thought the flat was still the way I wanted it. We get through the door to my flat and absolutely everything has been changed. I walk around and I lose my crap, saying to boyfriend that I told him not to go overboard. I started crying because he didn't respect my wishes and told me that mother-in-law had been there to help him. I lose it even more finding out that mother-in-law, who is a first-class snooper, has been in my apartment, touching my things and putting my life on display. Boyfriend got up in arms because I was being ungrateful and I said to him that I didn't want this. I didn't ask for this at all and to find out that mother-in-law had been there without my permission really made me mad. I said to him he should have consulted me about the changes he was going to make instead of just doing it and making me learn to like it. 
My dad came over, and I was in a foul mood, having just learned that my privacy and my home had been violated. Dad thought I was being unreasonable about the state of my house. Boyfriend and mother-in-law made it look like no one lives there. I stood my ground and said it was too much change, and now they have made it so I can't change it back. Boyfriend said I was the jerk because of my reaction to this. I'm starting to think I am, but I also feel like it was a healthy reaction to someone completely turning your house and stuff upside down without you knowing. So, am I the jerk? Edit. I've had a few people asking me if I'm a hoarder or have those types of tendencies. The answer is no, I'm not. I have no problem throwing stuff away. I usually keep a relatively tidy house, to be honest. It doesn't look like a designer home or anything, but it's lived in. Edit 2. Mr. Kitty is fine, but I don't think he trusts boyfriend as openly now, especially because boyfriend brought mother-in-law over. I hate to think what mother-in-law and boyfriend thought was okay while I was away. I really hope they didn't lock him in the bathroom while they were fixing my flat. Not the jerk in the slightest. That's end of relationship level boundary violating. I'm curious, why can't you put it back the way it was? Did he go so far as to make structural changes or sell your belongings? That would be lawsuit time. OP. He's filled the empty spaces with furniture that I can't lift or move, so I have to keep it the way he put it. He bought a whole second TV cabinet, so I can't put things back. What? No, no, no. This is unacceptable. He needs to get all that extra crap out of there, and then he needs to take himself out with the rest of the garbage. I'm so mad on your behalf. Of course you're not the jerk. What the heck is wrong with the men in your life? Oh my goodness. Or just sell it online, make some cash, and forget about the boyfriend. I think that's a better idea. Boyfriend actively lied to me. Red flags. His mommy knows best, and your boyfriend does what he's told. Not the jerk. This is the crucial point. He's not going to change, and he's going to carry on doing what your mother-in-law says forever. Weddings, joint houses, kids. I would strongly suggest reassessing this relationship. Yep, my ex's parents ended up on the trip with us when he proposed, stayed at the same hotel and everything. He had to do everything the way that mommy wanted. Years later, we still hadn't married, and he was talking about getting a dog when we moved and how it would have to be a good dog and spend lots of time with his parents' dog. And all I could think was, oh no, when we move back closer to them, we are going to have to see them every day again. And to be honest, I realized I didn't want to raise kids around his mother. Run, OP. It won't get better. Roommate thinks I'm responsible for her boyfriend's allergies. I, 19 female, have a roommate, Kayla, also 19 female. We've been roommates for almost one year. We have always had this shared refrigerator situation going on where we alternate every week or two on who buys the groceries, cleaning supplies, etc. But we don't cook for each other. Very important to the story. Well, six months ago, Kayla got a boyfriend, Caleb, who's 21, who has been spending a lot of time in our apartment. He would leave his mess every day. When I say everywhere, I really mean it. He would leave his clothes on the bathroom floor and living room floor. But the biggest issue was that he would eat everything. Even the things that were strictly mine, like leftover takeout and dinners that I cooked for myself. I've talked with my roommate about this multiple times and she said she would talk to him, but it doesn't really seem like she even tries to talk to him, which seems like she is enabling him to continue this behavior. Here's where the incident happened. Two nights ago, I made myself some dinner. I was following this recipe and I was making fried chicken that had some sort of sauce that contained honey in it, also very important to the story. Neither I nor my roommate has any sort of allergy, so I didn't say anything to her when I made it or when I put the leftovers in Tupperware and in the fridge. Well, yesterday I got back from work and my roommate wasn't home. I didn't question it and moved on with my day. A few hours later, I heard the front door open and a few moments later, my roommate enters my room and just starts yelling at me that I could have hurt her boyfriend and how I'm so irresponsible and how dare I put my food in the fridge unlabeled when her boyfriend is allergic to honey. But here's the thing, I didn't know he was allergic to honey. Here's where I think I might be the jerk. I tried explaining to her that I simply didn't know of her boyfriend's allergy and he should have never been touching my food knowing he has an allergy and could potentially be put himself in harm's way, which he did in this situation. I also mentioned that I told her to tell him not to touch my food and she blew up on me even more, saying that I'm dismissing her feelings and I mentioned that she's been dismissing mine ever since he got here. We ended the argument with me yelling at her that I'm not responsible for his allergies, 
and she should have never brought him around the apartment. I told my friend about what happened, and she told me that even though he was in the wrong for basically stealing my food, I should have never said that to my roommate because she was in a stressful situation where a loved one could have been hurt. Now I feel bad, and I think I might have been in the wrong. So, am I the jerk? Not the jerk. The boyfriend is. If the boyfriend is allergic, he should not eat anything without knowing what's in it. I would label everything I make as containing honey. His fault if he gets sick. I would honestly just start putting honey in everything and label it that way. No one steals my food. No one has an allergic reaction. Yep, put a drop of honey in a random bite of every meal, and that will prevent him from being able to eat anything in your part of the fridge. Edit, and yeah, let him know it all contains honey, of course. I don't know why she should let him know beyond maybe putting her name on it if she just continues on with a regular cooking. It's her food that he shouldn't be touching anyways. If she does put honey in everything out of maliciousness, then yes, label it has honey. Not the jerk, he stole it. He doesn't get to complain about the consequences of his own actions. If you don't like the way we do things here, you can leave. Okay. When I was in college, I worked for a mobile carrier in a mall. For a young person, it was great money. I was the assistant manager, which was a fancy way of saying I was in charge of most of the store paperwork. A few months before. One morning, I opened by myself and a guy approached me asking for a specific phone and kept balking at the price, asking if I could cut him a deal though. I was confident we were by far the cheapest in the area, so I told him, if you bring me a better deal, I'll beat it. The guy does another lap, talks to the other stores, and comes back. Come on, there's nothing you can do. Can I just get a case? I smile and say, sorry, that's the best I can do today. But can I get your number in case we get a sale that brings the price down? This sometimes actually did work. His entire demeanor changed, and he handed me paperwork out of his bag and showed me his ID. He was from corporate, LP, loss preventions. Apparently, my store ranked top in the state for excessive discounts and excessive waste. He then hands me a document showing all of my friends and family discounts. So I flip open my phone, yes, it's still flipped, and showed him all the names on the list are in my phone, thus our friends and family. He thanks me and says he'll stick around to talk to my boss and one other team member. Since smartphones aren't really a thing at the time, the LP guy starts talking to me about my phone, and I ask him a little more about what exactly flagged our store. Turns out, the other two people he wanted to talk to had more than 30% of their transactions marked with the discount code, and our store seemed to lose lots of inventory. Store practice was that if you open an accessory and it was damaged in shipping, you just throw it away and grab another one. Turns out, there's a process you need to follow. He showed me the form and said, you really should be between this and this much a month to be considered average. He then interviews my boss and coworker who couldn't prove that their discounts were accurate and they were left with a stern warning. From then on, I took on the responsibility of tracking inventory and warning the team when we were getting close to the monthly limit. Like a miracle, cases stopped breaking for the rest of the month with these announcements. Fast forward. I open by myself again one morning. An older gentleman approaches me and starts screaming at me about being a heartless jerk and asking, how the heck can you do this to people? I look at him puzzled. Sir, I have no idea who you are, so you can't possibly be mad at me specifically. Let's go over there and have a quick chat. So as soon as we sit down, I look at him and he starts crying and shaking. I don't know what to do. I'm going to lose my house. He goes on to tell me his son had gotten 10 free phones from my store and the monthly bill was roughly $800 plus tax. Sir, if your son started an account with us, there's nothing I can do without him coming to the store. The dad shows me a photo in his wallet and explains that his son lives in a home because he's too old to take care of him. He's visibly disabled. He was already barely getting by paying for his house plus his son to be taken care of. My heart dropped as I figured out what had happened. My coworker had sold the phones to his son while they were on a mall outing with his group home. Furious, I go back to the store and void the entire order. I instruct the dad to bring me every phone he can find. Anything not in the store that day would be marked as stolen. I write up the inventory report and mark all of the phones stolen for the time being. Coworker comes in and I say, don't bother clocking in. I saw your order from last night. Just know that it's voided. If you pull anything like that again, I'll make sure you're fired. Take the rest of the weekend off. He argues for a moment but leaves. 25 minutes later, and early for his shift, 
My boss shows up, saying he heard what happened. I show him all of the paperwork and explain what I did to solve it. Irritated, he looks at me and says something like, You know you can't do that, right? He then argues with me that I had no right to void the order and the contract was the contract. Confused and angry, I say, Look, I will not sit by and allow people to be taken advantage of like that. To which he replies, If you don't like the way we do things here, you can leave. Shocked, I walk back into the store where he tells me he is taking care of all of the paperwork to fix my mess. Quietly, I rip up the inventory report with a smile and tell him I'm leaving for the day. I call a friend who said, why don't you just get an IT job, what I was going to school for. He then calls a recruiter and sets up an interview for the next morning. Boss's little push gave me the drive to just go for it. I nailed the interview and got the job. My now ex-boss texted me shortly after and said, hey OP, you're late, to which I replied, no, I don't like the way you do things there. Silence. Fast forward a few months. Both the boss and the coworker were fired for theft. You see, with the unexplained missing phones and with no one watching inventory, loss prevention quickly took interest in the store again. Turns out the broken cases were actually team members giving away inventory to close sales. So when I was there balancing inventory and giving warnings, it was letting them know just how much they could steal and get away with it. Without me there, they just did whatever the heck they wanted. From what I hear, they were escorted out by security and all. So in the end, I was pushed to start the career of my dreams. They have a record. Sounds like they got more bars when the interference was removed. Fresh stitches under my hat. Teacher has a no hats in class policy. Sure thing. The car accident was one of the side impact variety and it was bad. One second I'm driving and the next I'm halfway out of the passenger window. Another second ticks by and I'm in the ER receiving 13 stitches for my scalp. I lost a large patch of hair. I also lost my favorite white fishnet t-shirt. That Friday of a Labor Day weekend was how my name shows up in the newspaper list of Labor Day weekend accidents. Tuesday comes and I go to class at the local college. Being a teenager gave me the gift of immortality. There I was, fully ambulatory, just four days after my accident. For the sake of propriety, I'm wearing a hat to cover the fresh injury. It was a white Panama hat with a bright 80s style hatband, as this was 1983. Everything was 80s style. Hobbling along, I make it to sociology just as class was beginning. I take a seat at the back of the class and settle in. The conversation went something like this. Excuse me, could you remove your hat, please? The teacher had her own sense of propriety. My hat didn't fit with a proper classroom attire. I was in an accident, I replied. Did she hear my words? Or was one of her rude students muttering another in a career-long list of excuses? Likely the latter was the case. Take the hat off. You cannot wear that in my class. Indicated she was not happy with my hat. Not at all. Well, okay then. Off comes my hat. Roughly a third of my hair had been shaved off. The wound was pink and puckered. The wound began an inch above my missing hairline and continued back, branching into a Y shape. The surgeon's instructions were to keep the wound clean, dry, and unbandaged. Lucky for all in attendance, my mother had washed my scalp the previous day. Imagine you're one of my classmates. Whatever you would say at that point would be something I heard from my classmates and friends. Ah, you can put your hat back on, said the teacher. Not before a little malicious compliance, I won't. But I can't wear hats in class, I replied. I mean, I can do it, but not if I'm breaking the rules. Please put your hat on. Okay, if you insist. And the hat went back on my head. My advice is to not engage in malicious compliance on the first day of class. Not in a course where the teacher gives essay questions. That was the only C I received that semester. Am I the jerk for being furious over a prank? and not letting my husband deflect blame onto brother-in-law? I have a brother-in-law who I've never really gotten along with. I feel like he's kind of a bully and he and his wife are so full of themselves. I would like to be no or less contact with him. Sister-in-law is a bit hashtag not like other girls type and thinks that she's better than me. We had a discussion once about how I would be so mad if my husband posted embarrassing pictures of me. Brother-in-law likes to troll her on social media or birthdays and anniversaries and I said I would feel so unloved. Well, it's her 30th birthday, and brother-in-law convinced my husband, I didn't know this at the time, that as a prank, he was going to get one of those embarrassing pictures of her tattooed on him. At first, my husband thought he was crazy, 
but brother-in-law convinced him that it was an elaborate prank. He somehow convinced my husband to do the same, so my husband took an awful picture of me and tattooed it on his back shoulder area. Well, when it was done, brother-in-law revealed his tattoo and it had nothing to do with sister-in-law and was something he had been wanting. The prank was on my husband all the time. My husband tried to brush it off, but I'm furious. I told him he's an idiot. He betrayed and humiliated me and it's going to take me a long time to move past this. Second, I said I am no contact with brother-in-law and sister-in-law for now and won't be at her birthday party. Third, I said if he keeps trying to blame it on brother-in-law, I will go stay with my parents because at the end of the day, he's a grown man and he chose to do it. Brother-in-law claims that it's funny and I need to lighten up. My husband seems to genuinely think the tattoo is funny and even sister-in-law says brother-in-law took it a little too far but she thinks my husband is a jerk for falling for it. I would say this reflects some of our marital issues such as him wanting me to be more fun. Not the jerk. Your husband is a total dum-dum. You better set up some boundaries with him before his brother gets him to do something even more stupid. I hope she doesn't have kids with this guy. He may be too stupid to want to procreate with. I mean, he got an embarrassing picture of his wife tattooed on him. That's a special kind of stupid. I had an ex who often complained I wasn't fun enough. What he actually meant was that he was unhappy that I wasn't willing to attempt to keep up with his habitual binge drinking and he felt judged for decisions he knew, deep down, were terrible and self-destructive. He wanted me to make those same decisions so he'd have an easier time convincing himself that he wasn't a chronic mess up or at least that he had a girlfriend who was as much of a mess up as he was. Definitely my own particular damage talking here. But whenever I hear a guy complaining that his girlfriend or wife is no fun, my first thought is, ah, she has boundaries and he can't stand it. Certainly seems to be the case here. Not the jerk, but your husband's humor seems to be quite similar to your brother-in-law's. You might not have noticed it because they didn't spend enough time together before or the pranks hadn't been that high level. Good on you for not letting him just pass on the blame and actually blaming both the parties involved. Sister-in-law and brother-in-law probably thought it was funny because of your comment of, you would feel so unloved, which was super disrespectful from them. However, this might be a very good moment to stop and evaluate boundaries with your husband and try to lie limits to what pranks can get to. I wouldn't trust him to not prank you, especially if he keeps in contact with brother-in-law. Not the jerk, but honestly, I would be much angrier at your husband than at your brother-in-law. Your husband was the one completely willing to put something humiliating for you permanently on his body. The fact that he thought brother-in-law was doing it to his wife too doesn't make that any less awful. In this case, your brother-in-law was the less jerky one because he didn't actually do it. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her husband? Please let us know. It's much easier to be married to someone who has a similar sense of humor to yours. Isn't that right, Reddit boy? I get paid to do what I am told, not what I feel needs to be done. Okay. Background. A decade ago, I was an admin for a hospital. One of two admin, a couple of techs, and a few application support people, and a couple of programmers. Our boss, the IT director, let's call him Fred, had a temper. Whenever something happened, if we didn't go directly to him for guidance, then he would get angry. Now, most of the team, he never yelled at or got mad at because he didn't know enough of IT to understand their jobs. For some reason, probably due to my demeanor at the time, not anymore thanks to him, I just took it and did what was asked and what was needed. He would take his anger out on me. It was so bad that the team often referred to me as the sponge, able to take Fred's red-faced yelling and after he vented, he was fine for a few days until something else set him off. The Catalyst One morning, our primary outward-facing web server died. This was not unexpected as I had been telling Fred that it was old and needed a refresh but he called me an alarmist and said as long as we had a system backup, we did, that it wasn't an issue. I mentioned if hardware died, we would have to have the hardware handy, but it fell on deaf ears. Well, when it happened, I got an alarm about it and was in the data center trying to get it back up and running when Fred comes in and tells me to get it working right away. I tell him I'm already on it, but it's looking like the RAID controller is hosed, that I doubted I could get it up soon and that I would need to harvest parts from DCOM servers to build one if he wanted it today and to order a new server immediately that the specs were in his email from me. He tells me that I have 30 minutes to get it back up and running or I will get written up for refusing an order and for neglecting my duties. I reply that even if I could get a server built and OS loaded in that time, 
it was going to take more than 30 minutes to copy the data over to the new server and that I cannot change the laws of physics to suit his fancy. He replied with, you now have 29 minutes and walked off. Yeah, he wrote me up for it. I took an hour to get it operational and the data took about as long to copy, but in the end, it was under three total. If I didn't sign, I would be terminated immediately, so I signed it, but added under duress. The beginning of the end. A few months later, Fred came to my desk and asked what I was doing. I told him I was going over patches that needed to be applied to various servers and hardening the ones that could not be patched for various reasons. Fred asked me, who told you to do that? He had assigned me a job and he expected me to get it done. The job he had assigned was setting up a laptop in one of the conference rooms for a CPR refresher class that was next week. It was Wednesday and I had all day that day and two more days to get it done. He chose me and not a tech because, well, I never knew exactly why. Even the techs were baffled, but you never argued with Fred. Anyway, I explained that I had plenty of time to get that done and would ensure before I left on Friday that it would be waiting and I would even come in early to brief the presenters. Well, that wasn't good enough. Fred proceeded to yell at me for 30 minutes in his office with the door closed per usual about how I was insubordinate and he paid me to do what I was told. When I was told to do it and that anything I thought that needed to be done, I was to immediately forget it existed and do only what was assigned by him. I was to be at his disposal at any time. I was on call a lot too. And that unless something was physically on fire, I was to do only what he explicitly assigned to me. I said, okay. Cue malicious compliance. For the next several months, I did exactly as he instructed. I did not mention patches or scan for vulnerabilities. I did not even log into a server at all unless he told me I needed to do something specific. I didn't even restart services or disable terminated users unless he told me to. We would get a list of terminated users each week, but unless he told me to work the list, I did nothing. The other admin did the same as well since it would have made his job impossible if he did it all. Then one day I got asked to apply for a position with corporate. I went to the interview and they already knew who I was and basically said they wanted me. They mentioned that policy stated that they had to tell Fred and I told them that if Fred found out, he would fire me because he wouldn't like the promotion over him. The role would have made me over his data center, but not his team. They said they doubted he would do that, so I said okay. Well, sure enough, when Fred got wind of my promotion, he fired me. The worst part, he fired me in a way that made it impossible for me to get the corporate job. They rescinded their offer. No reason given, but after speaking with a lawyer, it got changed to resigned because he would have made it impossible to work for him if I had returned. The fallout. A few weeks later, I had another job. Better pay, and I was the IT manager. About six months later, they had a data breach. Was nasty and all over the news. Fred was encouraged to resign. I learned much later that someone from my old team had contacted corporate and told them what happened and why Fred fired me and he got in really hot water. Then the data breach happened and he was going to be fired and he knew it, so he resigned before they could fire him. I looked him up a few times after that. He tried life as a contract manager but never finished any projects. Now he's retired. I wonder why. Edit. Since there is a question as to how I got did out of my promotion, I will paste my reply here. I'm sorry to leave it so vague. Corporate offered me the job on a Tuesday to start in three weeks. Fred fired me on Thursday. By Tuesday of the following week, Corporate reached out and told me that due to me being fired, they were no longer able to extend their offer. The person that called me was not the person that hired me. I told them to contact the person that hired me because he knew this would happen. They said it was not their policy to do that and I am ineligible for a review. I even tried emailing the person that hired me and he tried to go to bat for me, but corporate HR told him that I was not eligible for rehire. That is when I went to a lawyer. The lawyer wrote some letters and was able to get them to change my status, but because corporate hired someone already for that role, I would have to take my old role. I declined for obvious reasons, thus the resigned status. Am I the jerk for refusing to eat my mother-in-law's lunch? Hi, I legitimately love my mother-in-law and she sees me as her daughter. I became vegetarian a few weeks ago. I don't eat meat, including beef broth or chicken broth. I was with my boyfriend at my mother-in-law's house. She made some chicken sandwiches for my boyfriend. She told me, but don't worry, you and I will be eating vegetarian. I'll make us some chickpeas mixed with this. She's absolutely wonderful. I was so happy and grateful that she was willing to accommodate me 
especially since I had brought my own vegetarian soup, as to not be a burden. She prepared the food. It took about 20 minutes max, and when it was ready, I realized there was broth. I asked if it was beef broth, and she said yes, so I was mortified. Edit, not a native speaker. I really meant embarrassed. I told her I can't eat beef broth as a vegetarian. She apologized, so I told her not to apologize, because it's a mistake everyone makes. I told her I was so sorry she spent this time cooking for me. In the end, all was well, and I ate the soup I brought, while she ate the food she cooked. During the afternoon, I went to the gas station right next to her house and bought several packs of vegetable broth. Edit. Because I didn't want her to spend money on buying broth for me. Also, it's the normal Nor brand I use. I gave them to her, saying I was sorry for the misunderstanding earlier, and that this broth she could use if she ever wanted to cook for me, but that I would always bring my own meals because I don't want to be a burden on the family. When we got home that night, my boyfriend was furious. He told me I was selfish to refuse the food when my mother-in-law had wanted to accommodate me. He told me I was being too extreme and that beef broth is nothing. I explained it was a matter of principle, but he's absolutely upset. I didn't want to ask this question on a vegetarian subreddit because I want objective answers. Do you think I'm the jerk for refusing the broth? Thanks a bunch. Edit. I texted her to apologize again and ask if I hurt her feelings, and she replied, of course not, it was nothing. Also, she told me she used the vegetable broth to cook her rice tonight. Not the jerk. In a very unusual turn for this subreddit, your mother-in-law sounds genuinely lovely. Your boyfriend, not so much. OP. He's really not supportive of me going vegetarian, with thoughts of maybe going plant-based or vegan. It's a personal decision I made for myself. I would never want him to go vegetarian or vegan because of me. I still cook steaks and meats for him because he loves meat and I love him. I do my own groceries and cooking, so I'm not really a burden on him. Although I understand, it must necessarily be a bit annoying. As if he wants to cook for me, he can't use meat. If you want privacy, then move somewhere else, Karen. I live in an apartment with three bedrooms, one large room, a smaller room, and a room which they marketed as a bedroom, but is essentially a hyped up broom closet that barely fits a one person bed. I use the large room as a bedroom and the second biggest room as an office for my work, which is mostly done online even before lockdown, so I can't do without it and the smallest room is not big enough to house my setup and files and unless I massively downsize my bed, it doesn't fit in my room either, hence the office. The smallest room is set up as a guest room with a single bed, wall mounted TV and a small closet. It's cramped, but given it is usually just used for a few days by my cousins and friends, it works fine. The rest of the place is rather average. Normal apartment, small living room with a kitchen and a bathroom. My mom made a series of very dumb financial decisions since my dad passed three years ago, and with her losing her job due to lockdown, she had to sell her house to pay several debts. Let me be clear that the money she had could have had her living comfortably for the rest of her life without ever having to work again. She called me one day, explained the situation, and after a long argument, I relented and allowed her to move in with me until she got back on her feet, which I was angry about because I was on the brink of moving in with my girlfriend and this put that plan on hold for the foreseeable future. Well, since she moved in, it has been horrible. She complains every day about the smallest things. It only got somewhat better when she finally got a job, so she's out of the house for several hours. It honestly feels like I live with my parent, when in reality, she lives with me. I obviously put her in the guest room, and that has since been her primary aim for complaining. Not a day goes by where she does not complain about wanting the office as her room, as it's bigger. Obviously, that's not happening. Yesterday, she had a friend over. Afterwards, we got in another argument where she started yelling at me for not giving her any privacy, because I dared to go into my own kitchen to make a sandwich while she had her friend over. I finally lost my crap and said what it says in the title along with some choice words and I have the mind to kick her out at this point, even knowing she's got nowhere to go. She has made a scene about it towards her siblings and other family who have since reached out to me to tell me how much of an ungrateful jerk I am to talk to my mom like that. So I'm here for outside judgment. Karen expects me to dress differently because she's insecure. Hello everyone, I, 19 female have recently had a situation with my close friend, also 19 female, and it has had me conflicted on whether or not to compromise what I believe in order to maintain this four year long friendship. My friend and I have always been super open and honest with each other when it comes to personal details, whether it be mental health or struggles we go through, 
and it's something I value and appreciate within our friendship. We have both been open and honest about having issues surrounding the way we view our bodies and have always been big supporters of encouraging each other to embrace and love the way we look. However, recently this has seemed to change on her part. This shift all started when I went through my very first real heartbreak where I came out of a long-term relationship. In dealing with this heartbreak, I have not only tried to work on my mental health but physical as well. In doing so, over the last three months of hard work and discipline, I have started to see solid results in the way I look, including having a more toned and defined stomach, something I've always wanted to achieve. As I've seen these results, I became more confident in dressing in more revealing clothes, you could say, surrounding my midriff. As I've been dressing more like this, my friend has increasingly made little comments about reasons why I should change, and most of them didn't seem to make sense, whether it be the weather or location, etc. She has also started to criticize herself regarding her midriff more, to which I always make sure to reassure her that all bodies are beautiful and encourage her to embrace and love what she's got working for her. This kept happening for about a month until last week when she made a statement that caught me off guard. My friend informed me that the way I was dressing served as a trigger to other people and herself, and she does not want me to wear clothes that show my midriff around her because it makes her feel uncomfortable as well as others. This hurt me to hear, as I never do anything with ill intent, but also because it made me feel insecure about my body as well, as if I should be ashamed in some sense. After considering what she said, I informed her that I would not be changing the way I dress, and told her that telling someone their body is a trigger is wrong and damaging to my mental health. She called me selfish and said she would have thought I would be more understanding, but I'm not the friend she thought I was. I'm starting to wonder if I'm in the wrong and should just be covering up around her. So, am I the jerk for standing my ground and not changing the way I dress? Edit slash update. I just want to thank everyone for their words of encouragement and support. I appreciate it all. I don't have a huge update so far, but said friend reached out wanting to meet up and talk. She did not clarify it from her side if it was about our last conversation. Considering all the advice I received and support I had by standing my ground, I've decided to leave a bit of distance between us for the time being. I sent her a message, and to sum it up, I let her know I understand body image can be a big struggle, and although I still want to support her on her self-love journey, the way she chose to address me and my body was not okay. I also address that since I am taking time to build up my mental health as well, I need to be surrounded by people who would rather build me up than tear me down for my accomplishments. I tried to be firm in the fact I would not be continuing on this friendship without an apology and proper change in her words and actions, as sorry can only go so far if change doesn't follow. I'm trying to be as understanding as possible because I know body image issues can play into a lot of delicate things that can be damaging to oneself, but I'm also aware that I am not a professional and cannot offer her the help that she might need to be seeking. I have not yet received a response from her end. Not the jerk. For goodness sake, you have nothing to feel bad about. A real friend should be happy for you, not make you feel bad about what you have achieved. Show that midriff off. I say that as a fat person. This reminds me of victim blaming in a way, as if the way we dress should affect others who can't control their own issues. I agree with this commenter. Wear what makes you feel good. It doesn't really matter what anyone else has to say. I also want to congratulate you on your goals. To me, this doesn't sound like a revenge body situation, but one where you actively took initiative to work on your mental and physical health to make you happy. That is the best reason in the world to make any changes for yourself. It's like victim creating. I don't know, but I see the similarities as well. Like, you're doing good and showing it off, and that makes me feel bad for not doing good. Like, the kid that got an A on a test and was proud of it, and the kid who got a D feels bad. But it's not the kid with the A's fault. Definitely not the jerk. Definitely show off that midriff. And your friend really needs to work on some self-esteem stuff. She's the jerk for taking her insecurities out on you, but I also understand why she's doing it. I hope she gets some help and learns to love herself too. I hope that you're loving yourself as well. Congratulations on picking up something so life-changing and making yourself more disciplined. You should be proud of yourself. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her friend? Please let us know. I need some new Live Laugh Love shirts, Reddit boy. I want to show my midriff off as well. Am I the jerk for siding with a homewrecker? My sister, Annie, she's in her 30s, is obsessed with a girl, let's say Jane, she's in her 20s, that her husband cheated on her with in mid-2020. I don't know why. Jane's not the first or the last. She was one of the decent ones. Didn't realize he was married, broke it off when she found out, 
and sent the proof of his cheating to his wife. Somehow, he spun this as, she's trying to break us up, and my sister fell for it, which is stupid because Jane already blocked them on everything. He's the one that basically stalked her for months after. Anyway, Annie's been stalking Jane's socials. Anytime Jane posts about something bad happening, Annie calls me up to gloat. Anytime she posts about anything good that happens, Annie starts crying about how it's not fair. In the last few months, Jane apparently got a high-paying new job, got engaged, and is pregnant. Annie had a full-on meltdown over it. It's all she ever wants to talk about. She'll call me at least twice a week with this crap and text me multiple times a day. She doesn't want advice, doesn't want to leave him, just wants to vent endlessly. My other sister is also tired of this, but my mom says we need to be gentle because it's hard for Annie. I just want her to stop. I tried sympathy, tough love, changing the subject, suggesting counseling. Nothing works. It's nonstop. Jane did this and Jane did that. I hit my boiling point this morning when she was going on about how Jane's fiancé would cheat because she's too fat. She's pregnant. Then she said, I don't care because I won and she lost. She had him for a week and I have him for a lifetime. For some reason, that made me snap. I told Annie she won a slimy serial cheater who never supported her through illness or depression, never lifts a finger around the house, sulks about having to babysit his own kids, constantly makes mean jokes about her and criticizes her appearance harshly, even though he's below average in looks. I said something like, maybe you're obsessed with Jane's life because yours is a massive dumpster fire. Since then, I had to deactivate my socials because I'm getting nonstop hate from Annie her friends, and extended family for being cruel. Apparently, I have no morals and condone cheating. None of them are going for the actual cheater, though. Just me for pointing out that he's a cheater. My other sister says that I wasn't wrong, but I was the jerk to say it so harshly, and that Annie is a victim too. I don't know, Reddit. Am I the jerk? Edit. Thanks for all the comments and awards and advice. Sorry I can't reply to everyone. I'll keep suggesting therapy to Annie, and I'll track down Jane's social and let her know what's up. If anything happens from that, I'll let you know. Some people have suggested I show this thread to Annie, but I know she'll totally explode if she thinks I shared her private stuff online, even anonymously. Not the jerk. Your sister is obsessed with someone who her husband cheated on her with, broke up with said husband when she found out about him still being married and has since moved on. What your sister needs is professional help. OP. I wish she would agree to therapy, but she won't. She doesn't think she needs it. Might I suggest you contact Jane and tell her to put her accounts on private because of Annie stalking her. It's borderline creepy, and she's upset about this baby that isn't even born yet. OP, do you think she'll find it kind of sus if I reach out to her out of nowhere to tell her my sister is stalking her? She might, but she also might appreciate it. 50-50 chance. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her sister? Please let us know. We get what we settle for in life. Never settle for a cheater. Karen rebranded gifts I bought my nephews as being from Santa. This happened during Christmas last year. My older sister has always been a handful, one might say. She would generally act entitled, but then when someone makes her back off, she goes back to acting normal for a while before starting it all over. She got married a decade ago and has two young sons that are five and six. And every year, she makes sure there's something extra under the tree from Santa for them, which we're all fine with. But Christmas of 2021, she did something that blew my mind. The Christmas Eve gatherings with the whole family are usually held at my grandparents' house. That way, the individual families have their personal celebrations on Christmas Day with their own kids or with families of significant others or spouses. Last year, I was worried I might not make it to the Christmas Eve party as I was away on some personal matters. So I shipped the presents I got for relatives pre-wrapped in a large box to my grandparents' house just in case but I did manage to make it home the day before Christmas Eve by driving through several states. Everything went well, and we had the big dinner with both turkey and ham. I'm a real sucker for the turkey. Then came time for gifts. We draw strings for who passes around the gifts among the younger members of the family, and my 15-year-old cousin pulled the short straw. Everything was good until the presents I got from my nephews were passed to him. All the presents I sent in advance used the same wrapping paper, so it was pretty obvious after a while which ones were from me. But when the two boys got the ones I gave them, my sister pointed to new name labels on them both that were clearly pasted over the ones I'd put on them and exclaimed that they were from Santa, which made the two boys eagerly open them and shout with glee. I was pretty angry and my sister saw it on my face. 
She pulled me aside to talk, and I asked her what the heck she thought she was doing. She beat around the bush for a moment and said that since she thought I wasn't going to make it to the Christmas that year, that it would have been better if the kids thought the gifts were from Santa. I was furious and yelled at her. That caught the attention of my grandmother, who had also knew what happened. She begged me to keep quiet about the false Santa gifts, but I blew up over her wanting to rug sweep, and that attracted half the family into the kitchen to ask what all the yelling was about. My sister tried to say something, but I spoke over her that she had rebranded the gifts I got from my nephews as being from Santa. My grandfather looked at her and said, Is this true? My sister looked emotional and then did what she usually did when called out on something this bad. She started sobbing like a little kid and crouched down on the floor to have a pity party. Between sobs, she kept trying to defend herself, but the only one that was buying into her act was my grandmother, who only made more excuses like what my sister said. They thought I wasn't going to be there. It was for the sake of the kids, etc. My grandfather was unfazed though, and he, along with several other members of the family, said that she needed to make it up to me for this, because that means the boys technically got nothing from me that they know of when I clearly gave them nice expensive gifts that now they won't even know came from me just because of what my sister did. My grandmother finally backed off and briefly sided with the rest of us before going out to the living room to watch the kids. I then had an idea and said that I will give each of my nephews $50 bills for my wallet, and I expect to be paid that money back and get paid back for the gifts that were no longer for me because my sister had commandeered them. My brother-in-law sighed and agreed, then dragged my sister to the garage to have words with her. I gave my nephews each a crisp $50 bill and told them to buy whatever they like with it. My sister spent the rest of the evening almost silent. No more tears or anything, just silent. She may as well have been a mannequin on display or something. And before I left, my brother-in-law promised my sister will personally pay me back. I thought I was going to have to wait a good while to get the money back, but yesterday my sister and brother-in-law came knocking at my door and my sister meekly handed me an envelope with $200 in it and apologized to me. She started to make more excuses for what she did when brother-in-law told her to just stop. Because what she did was a crummy thing and she knows there was no excuse for it. So she just apologized one more time and walked back to their car, loudly sniffling in a tissue. My brother-in-law told me that $200 came out of my sister's account, and that was basically her fun money for this month, and maybe having a leaner month will teach her a lesson. Probably not, though. Edit. Sorry I forgot to include my gender in this. I'm a guy in my early 30s. Good for you, and good for brother-in-law to take it out of her fun money. OP. It should teach her not to do something like rebranding gifts from someone else again, but I doubt she'll change. She used to take credit for stuff she didn't do a lot, which is why all of the family knows that she's like this. Did your brother-in-law know what he was signing up for when he married your sister? Because it sounds like he has to parent her along with two actual kids. It seems like she likely doesn't have a job, so her contribution is what exactly? Being a crappy person and embarrassing herself and her spouse in front of others? It's also interesting how your brother-in-law says it was taken out of her fun money like she's a kid who receives a chore allowance from their parents. Is he sick of her crap? I'm always curious and baffled why seemingly responsible, mature adults get involved with and marry adult kids. OP. My sister put up quite the act when she was dating brother-in-law before they got married. About a year after they were married, she let her real self out, and as soon as she was pregnant, she quit her job and just sponged off her husband. Thankfully, the lot of us convinced him to get a signed prenup before marrying my sister, and that mostly keeps my sister in line. Because with that prenup, if he ever divorces her, she'd be done out of everything but child support, and she knows it. I know he'd leave her in a heartbeat if she ever had an affair, as he openly says that cheating is a deal breaker. After the incident with the credit cards, brother-in-law watches their credit a lot, so she can't open a new one without him knowing. The marriage is already on thin ice, and we really don't know how long it'll last. Brother-in-law seems to still love my sister in some way, but he doesn't give her everything she wants, which she initially tried to do. The past decade, he's been gradually unentitling her. She went crying to everyone at one point that he was being financially controlling towards her by not letting her use credit cards in his name. But we all sided with brother-in-law on that, even my enabling grandmother. Brother-in-law has also made it clear that when the kids are old enough to not need to be babysat anymore, my sister will be made to get a job again. And he's even been mulling over the idea of finding my sister a job she can do from home and watch the kids, which I think is a good idea. If you want the promotion, you'll have to be willing to work without the benefits. The entry-level position at my old company is a revolving door. 
The pay is low, the work is unrewarding, and the expectations are unattainably high for the vast majority of the staff. The average time in that position is six months. This is by design. It's a position that requires minimal training and there are plenty of applicants willing to work for minimum wage. It's actually a really great entry into the field and uses all of the industry standard practices and tools. Most people use it as a launching point for a successful career and move on to a higher paying job after half a year. One of the cool things about the position is that they offer a great perk for paid time off. You get one hour of paid time off for every 30 hours worked. There are no caps on accrual or limits on usage. It's a great way to attract recent college grads to the position. They feel like they're getting a great benefit and the company knows that they'll be gone in six months anyways, so they don't even end up paying for a lot of time off. I took the job fully expecting to be gone within a year, but I ended up thriving in the position. My bosses were impressed and they offered me raises if I would stay with the company and increase my scope of responsibility. Every time I started to think that my career was stagnating, they would make staying in that position worth it. After a couple of years, I had learned enough that I felt confident in my ability to take on a mid-level role, so I asked for consideration. The mid-level role comes with benefits and a salary, along with a title that would look great on my resume. The drawback was that this position has a cap of four days of paid time off usage per year. Still, it would be a great stepping stone in my career, so I was eager to move up. The only problem is that the mid-level position hires from a pool of candidates with an MBA, which I don't have. My boss told me they would love to have me work on that team and would give me a good raise, but I wouldn't get the title, salary, or benefits without an MBA. Works for me. I know how to write a resume and present myself in an interview, so the title is meaningless as long as I'm doing the work of that role. The pay increase would be great leverage while I searched for a new job. And I don't need the benefits. I don't need to be on the company's healthcare plan because I get free healthcare from the VA. I don't need their 401k plan because my wife's company has a better one. I don't need their student loan repayment benefits because the GI Bill paid for my degree. So I took the promotion, but I kept my original title. I don't think they realized this means I would also keep my original PTO structure and at the new pay rate, giving me that much PTO would be kind of expensive. After about a year in that position, I was ready to move on. I told my boss I wanted to use all of my available paid time off, and he said, no problem, enjoy your four days. No, you don't understand. I'm still an entry-level job title. I'm off for the next six weeks. I actually did take a month off and had a great time. Then I started job hunting full-time and quickly got offers. When my paid time off was over, I came back to the company with my two weeks notice. The timing was bad for the company because they didn't plan on spending that much on paid time off that quarter. I hope they've revisited their decision to tell me that I was capable of doing a job, but not qualified for the benefits of that job. Am I the jerk for refusing to watch my sister's stepkid and exposing her lies to her husband? I'm female, 21. My sister, Jess, who's 30, is married and has a five-year-old stepson. Her husband works full-time and she's a stay-at-home mom. Every Monday, she'd call my mom at 9 a.m. to get her to go over to her house and watch her stepkid for a few hours. I live at home with my parents and so I've noticed this routine for weeks now. Last week, mom went out of town to visit some relatives and yesterday, Monday, at 9 a.m., my sister called me asking me to come over to watch her stepkid for a few hours because she had an important thing to do. I said no because I had to go study and also she does this every Monday so clearly it wasn't important or urgent, but she insisted that it was. I told her sorry, but no. She ended the call then, and I went to the university. Hours later, I got a call from my brother-in-law asking me where my sister was. I said I had no idea. He proceeded to tell me he just came home at 1 p.m. and found his son by himself at the house. I was in shock that my sister left her stepkid by himself so she could go who knows where. I told him about the conversation I had with her, and he got angry. In the evening, my sister came over and started making a scene by yelling at me for bailing on her after she sent me a text message telling me she was already out of the house to force me to come watch her kid. I didn't see the Facebook message till she told me, but she said I did this deliberately and also exposed her to her husband because she told him she'd be at home with the kid. Not just that, but I also told her husband that mom comes over every Monday morning to watch the kid for a few hours, which caused a huge fight between him and my sister. She yelled that I was petty and selfish and just stirred crap and caused issues in her marriage by tattling to her husband. I couldn't keep arguing. I went into my room and started playing music. My dad and the others said I was to blame for not helping my sister and now being the reason she and her husband are in conflict. Am I the jerk? 
Okay guys, so I saw a few questions asked multiple times, so I'll just put the answers out here for all to see. Edit. Brother-in-law is always at work when my sister calls my mom to come over and watch her kid. Most of you guys are asking where my sister goes every Monday, and I even saw someone mention that I was the jerk for not finding out. But I don't know anything. I have no idea what's going on with my sister, and I thought it was none of my business. Not the jerk. This is bonkers. She left a five-year-old alone, counting on a messaging app on a social network and your sense of concern for her kid to make sure her responsibilities were covered. I don't think going out one morning a week is a problem for a stay-at-home mom, but lying to your husband about it and forcing your relatives to cover it? No, sir. Not the jerk. I hope her husband questions her on what exactly she does and where she goes when she's supposed to be watching the kid. That's really sketchy. It sounds like she just wants to spend some quality time with her boyfriend. Bag of nails. I'm a dry liner, which means I do a lot of moving around for my trade as most of the work I do is towards the end of most projects. This means that I spend a lot of my time renting flats and houses for only short periods of time, usually about six months at a time. This has meant that I have had to deal with a lot of landlords over the years, both good and bad. When it comes to the bad landlords, I will normally just walk away and get on with moving to the next job and take the loss of my deposit and never use them again if I'm working in that area in the future. But this particular landlord got my back up so badly, I was not just going to just walk away. I had managed to get myself into a big job in London working on the new Wembley Stadium, so decided I would look for a house to rent rather than a flat as I knew I was going to be working on it for a while and found a reasonably priced, for London, house to rent from a private landlord in a local newspaper. I gave him a call and met with him later that day. He seemed okay, went to view the house, paid him the deposit, cash, and moved in that weekend. I ended up staying in the house for nearly a year with no problems, always had the rent paid into his bank account on time and fixed any small problems that might crop up with the house myself without bothering him. Up to the time when it came to moving out, only ever spoke to him twice on the phone after there was an issue with the heater that I was unable to fix myself and he sent an engineer around the next day to fix the boiler. Come the time that the job was finishing, I went round to the pawn shop that he owned to give him notice that I would be moving out the following month and to let him know I was happy for him to come around to inspect the house before I moved out so that I could get my deposit back from him when I returned the keys. He never came around while I was in to inspect the house, and so I assumed that he had come around and let himself in while I was at work, as I had told him that I had no issue with him doing that if need be. So on the day I moved out, I went around the shop and handed him his keys back and asked for my deposit. His response was, What deposit? The month's rent that I gave you in advance of moving in as a security deposit, I replied. He then told me he was keeping that to cover the cost of repairing damages caused while I was living in the property. I responded, what damages? With the bits of work and decorating I had done in the house, it was in better state now than it was when I had moved into it. His response was to step forward and get right up into my face and say, you're not getting it back, so buzz off. And he then gave me a shove, which needed me to take three steps back to avoid falling down. Now, I'm what you would class an average size and build, and this landlord had a good four inches on me height-wise and obviously spent some time down at the gym and the wise move would be to back away and cut my losses. Now, before I was a builder, I was a member of the British Army in a regiment called the Royal Green Jackets, and they had trained us the best way to proceed when confronted with aggression is to meet it swiftly and with much more violent aggression. So without even thinking about it, I started to move forward with the full intention of dropping this guy quickly and painfully. After the first step though, a thought popped into my head like a bolt from the blue. So I stopped and took a moment to examine the idea from a few different angles, said, okay, bye, to my now ex-landlord and walked out of his shop. What the landlord did not know was that I had a spare back door key cut when I lived in the house, which I had stashed in my van in case I ever lost the keys so I could still get back in. So later that evening, I let myself back in and decided to stop for one last night before leaving in the morning for my next job, which was in Scotland. I spent the last night in the house carefully removing every bit of wood in there. I took down doors, removed skirting boards, banisters, and floorboards, being extremely careful not to damage anything. I also completely dismantled all the kitchen units, took up the wood flooring and carpets. I then left everything in neat piles in each room. I got in my van the next morning and was preparing to start my drive when I decided I wanted to rub a little bit of more salt into my ex-landlord's wounds. So I stopped at his shop on the way out of London, got a spare hammer, 
screwdriver, bag of nails, and a box of wood screws out of the back of my van and went into the shop. My ex-landlord was not there, probably for the best, so I left the tools with his confused-looking assistant and told her to tell her boss, you will be needing these, and left for my drive north. I had my phone switched off while driving, and a few hours later, while I was having a bite to eat at a service station up by Nottingham, I decided to switch it back on, and was greeted by a string of text messages and some very colorful voice messages, which left me chuckling to myself. Edit. I did reply to one of the texts he sent me. The text was, Do you think you're funny, leaving me nails and screws? I responded, Yes. Am I the jerk for telling my roommate her mom can't stay at our apartment? Me, 25 female, and my roommate, 25 female, have been living together for almost six months now. We're both nurses, work in different hospitals, and have been friends since nursing school five-ish years ago. For some background, I have two sisters and I'm the youngest in our family. My mom divorced my dad and left our family when I was two years old. My dad is amazing and became the best single dad in the world. Was both dad and mom for his three daughters. He's literally my best friend. Anyway, my dad, 67, male, lives two hours away now. In October, I had a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday off in a row. I missed my dad a lot and told him I was coming home to see him. He said he'd love to see me, but asked if he could come to where I live since he had some friends and wanted to see as well. I said, of course. I told my roommate he was coming to visit for the weekend and she said, cool, is he staying at the hotel? Which is a hotel close by. I said, well, I thought he could stay here. He can stay in my room and I'll sleep on an air mattress on my floor. She basically said she thought he should stay in a hotel. I figured she didn't want the apartment cramped We've never had guests stay for that long, and my dad said he didn't mind, so the two of us stayed at the hotel for the weekend. Fast forward to now, my friend informed me that her mom is coming to visit and is planning on staying a week at our apartment. I was confused and said, she's not staying at the hotel? And she pretty much said what I told her about how I planned for my dad to stay. I called her out on it and said that my dad was only coming for two nights and she didn't want him here, and that her mom is staying for a week. She told me that having my dad stay and having her mom stay are completely different because she's a woman and he was a man. I got really upset with her statement. My dad has always been so nice and welcoming to her. He and I will meet halfway for dinner once a month and my roommate has gone with us on several occasions. I got really upset with my roommate and told her that I didn't want her mom to stay at our apartment and she needed to stay at the hotel like my dad had to do. My roommate is now mad at me, but I feel like I'm justified in being upset at the double standards. Am I the jerk? Edit 1. We've both had male guests come and stay before. We've always been respectful and let each other know when they were staying over. That's never been an issue. Edit 2. When she said no to my dad staying, she never mentioned it was because he was a man. She said that our apartment would be cramped and that she had to work on some of those days and had to go to sleep early and wake up early. Only mentioned it was because he was a male when I called her out on it when she told me her mom was staying. Thanks so much for everyone's input. Not the jerk. If the rule is no air mattress campouts, then no air mattress campouts. Mom can stay in a hotel. Demote me for daring to take professional obligations seriously? Are you sure about that? I had been working contentedly for a local clinic in administrative capacity. I was hired on as a medical biller originally, but over time my duties expanded into more information management and upper level administration, and everyone from the CEO to the most junior employee knew I was good at my job. I didn't brag, but my work spoke for me. One of the certifying organization's motto for billers is upholding a higher standard, and I was doing my best to abide by it. Things were perking along, and then the clinic merged with a larger group of clinics, and they had a centralized billing office. I was on site more often than not, and knew clinic operations backwards and forwards as I was functioning as the de facto manager. As the merger took effect, I realized that I did not mix with the central office at all. They were rude and clicky, and apparently it was known, but nothing was ever done about it. When I refused an order to commit a fraudulent act, the next day I was out all morning for an important doctor's appointment. I came back to a new set of job duties, all front desk. This was during lockdown, and it was institutional knowledge. I work front desk during flu season. I get sick with the flu two to three days later, no matter how many precautions I take. I was beyond peeved, because it was effectively a demotion, and when I spoke with the manager, she said flat out, you are now front desk and bound by the expectations of such. Okay, demote me for acting honorably and placing me in harm's way? That can't go unanswered. I was beyond furious 
but I had a lot of institutional knowledge and a lot of unofficial duties. If they were going to put me on front desk and be bound by that set of expectations, then I was going to give them a master's class on work to rule. This change in position was not communicated to the clinic manager, and when I told him, he said, what are they thinking? But he didn't have enough work for me as a front desk person, so I spent my days job searching on the clock. Not something I would recommend, but it was either that or be bored out of my skull all day long. But every time I was asked a billing question, I said, I'm not the biller. You need to take it up with the central billing office. After a few weeks, central billing office caught on as I was adding more work back onto them and tried to give me a few tasks back. I used a customer service rule to argue against it and they had to admit I had a point. When the original CEO found out what was going on, he called it a waste. I suspect words were said and I got a larger portion of my job back in an hour. So not only did I give them a well-deserved education on why one does not mess with a good employee, and rumor is they still haven't learned or don't care to learn, but I also got paid to job hunt for my next position. Karen demands I hire a nanny to watch her baby so she can go party. My daughter, 17 female, has a one-year-old daughter. The father is not around. We sued for child support and won, but he has never paid a dime. It was very important to not only my daughter, but myself and her mother that she finish high school, then go to college. Therefore, we made a deal. We will cover childcare expenses and everything related to the child, diapers, clothes, insurance, etc., until she graduates from college. In exchange, our daughter will focus on school and care for her daughter when she is home. Due to lockdown concerns, my wife and I have decided that a nanny would be better versus putting her in daycare exposed to the other kids. The nanny is a very sweet woman who in the past has offered to watch our granddaughter extra hours. We always tell her that won't be necessary. My daughter usually leaves for school right before the nanny arrives, so I stay with my granddaughter for 10 minutes. Today, when the nanny came, we were talking about potential bad weather that might close the roads for tomorrow. As she doesn't work Fridays, my wife is home and watches the baby. I said I'd pay her for the week now, including a full day for Thursday. She said we could just pay her on Saturday. I was confused and she said my daughter had asked her to work. I told her, one, my daughter did not hire her. She doesn't choose the hours, we do. Two, unless our daughter needs to study or something, we won't be needing her. I waited until my daughter came home to talk to her about it. She said that her friends were going to a party. She feels overwhelmed from school and caring for a baby. I told her I understood, but this was our deal. She started to cry and said that all her life is, is school and baby. I hugged her, told her that this was the bed she made and she was lucky to have the arrangements she does. If she wants to earn her own money, she can get a part-time job and pay for childcare in her free time. That just made her more upset. My wife agrees with me, but our daughter is very upset and thinks we should just cave just this once. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. This may be unpopular, but I agree with you and your wife. What clinched this was that she went behind your back on this. She might have asked you about having a night off to have fun. That's a reasonable request, but she didn't. She tried to sneak one by you. 17 and the mother of a one-year-old, she still has a lot of growing up to do. Adults talk and tell each other what's going on. She's a child raising a child. Talk to her, work out something so she gets to be a teenager at least once or twice a month. These are not easy times we're in. I agree, not the jerk at all. She made the choice to have a kid and now she's stuck with the consequences. Don't like not being able to go party? Where there's likely going to be drinking going on that shouldn't be? Sucks, friend. You're a mom now. Moms have to put their child first, no matter what. She's also getting free childcare while she goes to school and doesn't work, which most young parents would do anything for. She's being ungrateful, especially because she's gone behind her parents' backs to get what she wants. Moms have to put their child first, no matter what? I don't think that's true. I'm a mom and occasionally I'm allowed to do things for myself. Always putting my kids and my husband first doesn't make me the best parent I can be. If all this poor girl is doing is school and parenting and she is as burnt out as she says she is, she can't be a very good mom to her kid. I'm not saying what she did was right, but she deserves a break or she will literally break. And honestly, I think it's crappy for OP to tell the daughter if she wants to have any free time, she has to get a job to earn money to pay for childcare. The daughter would probably make less than a nanny, so how can she earn enough to pay for the nanny while she works and save enough to pay her so she can go out too? Or was OP offering to pay the nanny while the daughter works? 
It didn't sound like it, so OP wasn't offering a realistic solution, i.e. the daughter will never be able to do anything other than study and parent. I think it sounds like the daughter is being punished for having the baby, but being told she is lucky. Gaslighting at its finest. Parents don't get a night off. Didn't that Dayquil commercial teach you anything? The problem with this setup is that she needs to grow up. Yeah, yeah, she's a kid. Boo-hoo. Well, she's a kid who decided to keep a kid. It ain't all teen moms, honey. It's hard work, and sometimes you miss parties, especially if you don't communicate. Imagine if this girl had said, Hey mom, Susie is having a party on Saturday. Can you watch the baby? Or can you pay nanny to watch the baby? It would have been way different. Teaching responsibility is part of parenting. That's all this dad is trying to do. Parents get nights, or at least hours and time off all the time. Grandparents take them. Spouse has them while the other goes out. Family babysits. Friends watch kids, etc. Now she's 17 and some of these aren't available and etc. But to say parents don't get time off as a blanket statement is dumb. She's always a parent, but most parents once or twice a month will get some child free time. And this is better for their kid because burnt out and sanity management is real. 100% she should have communicated and not gone behind her own parents' backs though. She's not actually always a parent. Her parents are kind enough to let her focus on studies, so she is free of her baby for quite a while every day. Yeah, WTF, as if no socializing occurs at high school. This daughter has about the best possible arrangement here for a teen parent who insists on keeping the baby. Imagine what it's like for so many others without wealthy parents. OP is being extremely reasonable. I get the impression that they'll work with her on important stuff like prom too. To portray this as though she's suffering from anything but her own choice is asinine. You don't teach responsibility by burning out a kid. She messed up. Big deal. Now she's acting according to the deal. But she's still a kid. Do we really want to read about something bad happening to that baby because the mom was depressed and didn't see a way out? Just because she has it good doesn't mean it's not heavy on her teenage mind. It's a situation that messes up adults. Imagine kids. Yeah. This time she doesn't get to go to the party because she went behind her parents' back, but using maternity as a punishment isn't going to get anyone far. I agree with not the jerk, but the line, this is your bed, now you lie in it, is a bit harsh. I mean, your daughter is practically a baby and made a bad choice. Maybe offer her another way to pay back for a night out with friends, and I agree that sneaking out is a bit shady. In general, it seems that you are hostile to the baby. Not the jerk. You're being very kind, supportive, and reasonable here. She's lucky to have such an arrangement. But she's also still a teenager, who, yes, has to suffer the consequences, for lack of a better term. I'm sure the kid is much loved. But will need fun on occasion. Or her kid might suffer too. She's still a kid herself, despite the very grown moment of having a baby. Maybe if she has one night a month or something and scheduled ahead, you could come up to an agreement. Not the jerk. She's lucky her life is school and baby, and not job and baby, or welfare and baby. That being said, if she had come to you first and asked you or her mother to babysit, then maybe you would have done so as a one-off. Pretty common for the grandparents to do that on occasion, even for a teen mom who has made her bed to lie in. She went way out of line by asking the nanny to do this behind your back. I can see your side of things, but you really need to remember that she's still a kid herself. She's taking the best possible path forwards by being responsible and finishing school with plans to go to college. Outside looking in, that's huge. I've got a teenager that's in the same age range, and personally, if this were my kid, I wouldn't be caving in this time because it gives the impression that I can be pressured into giving in. But I'd definitely be making sure that they got a chance to be a kid every now and then. She's only a kid once, and though she's made some massively life-altering decisions, it would be wrong to completely deny her the opportunity to be a teenager while she still has the chance. 50-50, you're not the jerk yet, but you could easily become the jerk. Everyone sucks here. I don't agree with how your daughter handled it, but I will say I do think that your daughter still needs some time every once in a while to have some me time. I think a lot of people get so hung up over their ideas for young mothers that they use the resulting kid as a punishment and completely forget that we tell older, married, settled, etc. mothers that it's okay for them to take time to themselves. If all your daughter does is literally care for her kid in school, she's going to burn out. She still needs to be allowed to practice some self-care and to be an individual. The child shouldn't be a punishment, and I think this course of action is just going to breed resentment all around in the long term. Well, who do you think is the jerk? 
OP or his daughter? Please let us know. Bruh, let her go to that party. Maybe you'll be lucky enough to get a second grandkid. <laughs> My wife, a stay-at-home mom, constantly expects appreciation from me. I, 36 male, work full-time, and my wife, 32 female, is a stay-at-home mom looking after our two-year-old twins. When we got married, we both agreed that my wife would be a stay-at-home mom, especially since we don't have any family or grandparents nearby. We were both in agreement, and my wife made it clear she wanted to enjoy seeing our kids grow up. We don't plan on having any more. I make a good wage, so we are comfortable. I don't give my wife any spending limits. Obviously, we discuss big purchases, so she's free to buy herself things. I make sure she has access to money and she takes care of everything around the house. I work from home and a typical day for me is 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Once I finish work, I go and spend time with the twins while my wife makes dinner. We put them to bed together and my wife usually cleans up the kitchen. She's great at her job and the house is spotless. I'm happy with this arrangement and I thought my wife was too. Recently, she's been coming to me and saying that she feels burned out, unappreciated and taken for granted. I asked if I could do anything to help and she said that it would be nice if I did something now and again to show that I appreciated her, like buying her favorite bar of chocolate when I go to the shop or something small, just as a gesture of appreciation. I'll admit that I didn't do this, purely because I am not in the habit to be honest. We recently had a massive argument because my wife got completely fed up with being treated like a servant. She basically said that her working hours are 5 a.m. to 9 p.m. seven days a week and that she feels like I take her for granted. I told her that I understand it's a tough job, but we both get on with our respective roles. I never ask her to thank me for making money. I think that's cringeworthy. I get on with my job because I have to provide for my family, whereas she wants presents and treats for doing her job. I essentially said this to her and now I'm wondering if I'm the jerk. Looking after kids in the house is tiring and she does work hard to take care of everything. But at the same time, do I need to thank her on a bended knee and buy her things just for doing her job? Am I the jerk? Edit. Okay, you can all stop tearing me a new one. I get it. I do get to relax on the weekend, whereas my wife usually does her normal routine and gets on top of the cleaning, etc. Just for the record, I do thank her for everything she does. I say thank you all the time but I understand that this may not be her love language. You're the jerk. Is it really too much for your wife to ask that you occasionally buy her a bar of chocolate or say thank you? It sounds like she's working harder than you, but that isn't even the point. Appreciating her and showing her you love her is part of being a decent husband. If you're a robot who doesn't need appreciation, that doesn't mean she has to be too. You're the jerk. I have three-year-old twins and a new baby. I've been a mother every waking and sleeping minute of the day for just over three years, not including a nine-month pregnancy with two babies that equal nine months of illness, sickness, and a broken body. Your wife is working all the time. You get to clock off at five and you don't even have to travel to work. Your wife not only keeps two small humans alive, your wife not only keeps your house in excellent condition, your wife not only cooks and keeps on top of food prep and buying, etc., your wife not only drives everywhere to get things done but she does this every day for two years without asking for anything from you. Then the moment she does, the moment she opens up to you about how she feels, you dismiss her feelings and tell her you won't even help her feel a little appreciated? Well, newsflash, you get the feeling of appreciation, a job done every time you make money, every time you please coworkers or clients, every day you keep your job. Two-year-olds cry and complain and eat and cry and laugh, no one stops to tell her or even gesture that your wife is a superhero like every stay-at-home parent. Buy her a chocolate bar and some flowers, then use them to knock some sense into yourself. Edit to add, if you're a stay-at-home parent and you read this comment and say you don't agree because you feel appreciated by your kids as infants, then that's great, really it is. But this woman doesn't and she opened up to her husband about her feelings and he dismissed them. He says she shouldn't need a treat as if she's a dog, a performing dog. You're the jerk, dude. I'm a stay-at-home wife too. I'd be single if my husband treated me like this, especially because I'm running an entire farm on my own while he's at work. From the title, I was expecting her demanding way more than an occasional candy bar and some verbal affirmation. This man is married to an absolute sweetheart and he doesn't see it. I'm not a stay-at-home mom and my husband brings me chocolate bars all the time. It's not that hard. I've spent periods functioning as a stay-at-home mom, summers, and periods working full-time. Being a stay-at-home mom isn't necessarily harder, 
but it's a different kind of hard. It's isolating in a way that's hard to shake. At work, when I do something well, I get a high five from a coworker, or I get a student telling me something was helpful. Parenting toddlers, they don't and can't do that because they're babies. Their whole life experience is based on meeting their needs and wants. It's grinding and mentally hard, and your wife is parenting twins and keeping the house really clean? She's a rock star and deserves way more than cards and chocolate. My house was a train wreck with one toddler and one preschooler. Please, OP, listen to her. She's isolated, probably lonely, working a repetitive job with two tiny people who are constantly trying to destroy the house and find creative ways to get hurt. Think about the hours you spend watching them. Imagine doing that while also cooking and cleaning. She does that all day, every day. I bet it would mean a whole lot to her for you to spend some time noticing and valuing what she does. Wow, spouse. Kid number one knows all of her colors now. You're doing a great job at this mom thing. Thanks for finding extra time to plan the twins' birthday. It's going to be a lot of fun. Hey, spouse. I found a sitter free next Friday. Let's go out to dinner since we've both been working so hard. Just make her feel seen and appreciated. It goes a long way for a stay-at-home parent whose job can easily feel invisible. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. I'm feeling a little unappreciated myself, Reddit boy. King size Twix, make it snappy. Stepmom, let my stepsister break my birthday present before I even got it. I, 14 male, really like steam trains and my favorites are from Britain. My parents are divorced and both my mom and dad got remarried. My stepmom has two daughters from another marriage, Kelly, who's 18, and Anne, who's nine. When I was 12, I started mowing lawns and walking dogs so I could get some money and start collecting models. Since there's so many different models out there and so many liveries, I decided to limit myself to preserved locomotives and the liveries they're preserved in and unique locomotives. This Christmas, my mom and stepdad surprised me with four out of the six preserved A4s, Mallard, Bittern, Union of South Africa, and Dominion of Canada. On my birthday, January 14th, I asked my mom, stepdad, dad, and stepmom for the remaining two A4s, Dwight D. Eisenhower and Sir Nigel Gresley, and my mom and stepdad got me Sir Nigel Gresley and the rebuilt W1. I went to my dad's the next day and saw my dad, stepmom, and stepsisters. I opened my gifts, and when I was done, my dad went and brought another bag out. I pulled out the tissue paper, and there was a model train inside. I pulled it out, but before I could look at it, the model fell out. I looked at the box and the back was ripped out. I showed my dad and he looked confused when stepmom chimed in. Oh, Anne threw a tantrum, so I let her play with that last week. I looked at the model and the paint was all scratched and the side rods were bent. One of the axles was cracked too. I was really upset that Anne did so much damage and my stepmom just put it back into the box. I was upset since I didn't have much there and the little bit of stuff I do have there, Anne's broken. I angrily asked, why do you let her break everything of mine? And my stepmom said, just get over it already. I snapped and said, I will when you stop letting Anne be so spoiled and start being a better parent. That ticked her off and she called me an ungrateful jerk. I asked my dad to take me home and he did. I talked to my dad a little on the ride home and he said he would get me a replacement. He came with a replacement today after school with stepmom and Anne. I thanked them and my dad made Anne apologize. I felt kind of awkward because I had nothing to talk about, so I asked if they wanted to watch me run it. They came to my room and my stepmom saw the other five A4s and W1. The W1 got rebuilt with an A4 boiler, so they look similar, and started to flip out that I wasted their money and she tried to take the model from me. My mom and stepdad came in before she could grab it and asked what happened and my stepmom told them that I wasted their money because I already have models like the one they got me. My mom tried to explain that it looks similar because it's part of the same class, but my stepmom wasn't having it. My stepmom tried to grab it again, but my stepdad intervened and kicked them out. My stepmom started to make a scene, but my dad seemed embarrassed and quickly said, let's just go, and grabbed Anne in my stepmom's hands and pulled them to the car. This might sound bad, but you might have to limit your time with your dad if she doesn't change. And it's your dad's fault as he isn't stepping up and protecting you from her. And happy late birthday. OP. I think I do have to limit my time with him since he's not stepping up. And thank you. Am I the jerk for throwing a tantrum while pregnant? I'm 30 weeks pregnant and I have a lot of appointments I have to go to about 45 minutes away. My husband broke his leg over the holidays 
and I've been told I'm not allowed to drive because of one of my complications, so we've been trying our best to manage with all of that. One thing we've been doing is paying a good friend of ours $50 and a homemade dinner to drive me to appointments. It's worked out really well. I casually mentioned it to my mom and she threw a fit and said she would drive me. I declined as I was comfortable with the arrangement with our friend. Well, last week, my mom knew I had an appointment, so she, coincidentally, came to drop some stuff off. I really don't like when she comes by unannounced, so I was a bit annoyed, right before and insisted on driving me. It felt a bit diva-ish to ask our friend to still come when she was there and willing, so I agreed. We were almost late because she insisted on stopping for Starbucks in the city. I got bad news in the appointment and she just complained about how bored she had been. People can't join me for these appointments, it's a clinic rule. She made five different stops to shop while I sat in the car just wanting to get home to process the news and lay down. I said this to her multiple times, but it was, oh, just one thing, just one thing. Then she said she wanted to stop at a friend's house because they wanted to see me. I snapped at her. I told her absolutely not, and I needed to be home now. She was quiet the rest of the drive, and as we were getting close to my house, she said, Well, if we don't do things for family, maybe I'll cancel my flight and not come help you the week the baby is born. I was stunned. She's going to her place out of the country soon, and I specifically told her we wanted two weeks minimum on our own with the baby. I didn't know about this flight. She booked the flight the week I'm supposed to deliver without consulting me. She won't have a place here then either, because she does this kind of timeshare rotate, so she was just assuming she'd stay with us. I lost it. I told her there would be no space for her, as I'd asked my mother-in-law to be there the first few weeks leading up to labor, and then she would be leaving the day we got home to give us our two-week period, so she needs to find somewhere else to stay. She yelled at me about what a traitor I was to have asked my husband's mom and not her. I told her this whole day was another example of why that was the case. Don't even get me started on the international travel side of things. We were about 15 minutes from my place at the time, so she told me to get out of the car and left. I walked the rest of the way home sobbing, and now my sisters and aunts have all messaged me about how I need to apologize to my mother and how I was throwing a tantrum and being unkind. Am I the jerk? ETA. Wow, I wasn't expecting so many comments, but thank you everyone for the input and support. I really appreciate the perspective, even the you're the jerks. I'm reading through all the comments and wish I could reply to everyone, but just wanted to say thank you. And also, thanks for my first award. I'm going to sleep on it and come up with a game plan in the morning, but I'm really realizing behavior I've kind of come to accept as normal is pretty inexcusable, and I don't want that around my baby. So I will be planning on going low contact or no contact strategies until things improve. Also, for those worried, to clarify, the walk was 15 minutes, luckily, not a 15 minute drive with a much longer walk, and I still am encouraged to do light activity for now. So while it sucked, and obviously unplanned sad walks are awful, it wasn't too damaging. Not the jerk. Mom was way out of line with just about everything. Yeah, OP, your mother is unable to consider your needs above her own, or even as equal to her own. You're dealing with a lot. A pregnancy with no complications is tough enough on its own, and you deserve to be surrounded by people who support you and care for you. Part of supporting and caring for someone is doing it in the fashion they request, not forcing yourself into the situation, by the way. Do not let anyone suggest that you owe your mother anything. Your pregnancy and your baby are not about her, no matter what she says. Do not hesitate to cut her off and anyone else who so readily and blatantly demonstrates that they do not care at all about your best interests. Not the jerk and the best of luck moving forward. She left a pregnant woman in the middle of the road that was 15 minutes. Not sure if that's walking or driving, but still. Not the jerk. And next time, OP, when you talk to your sister and aunt, just ask them if that is okay. Just because you didn't give in to her overbearing demands. I was ready to call her mom the jerk as soon as I heard she stopped by accidentally and pushed the whole I'm driving you thing. With every new paragraph, I was thinking, wow, how annoying she is. But then things got a whole other meaning. From being pushy, inconsiderate, and without boundaries, she became malicious and evil. She's a narcissist and she may very well put her grandchild's life in danger. Her pregnancy has complications. She just received bad news. She was already under stress, which is bad, but then her own mother throws her out of the car to walk for 15 minutes while sobbing. Goodness, the rage I'm feeling. Just a question, 
Whose car was it? Not that it matters, but if she lives overseas, does that mean she was driving OP's car? OP. Fortunately, it was her car. She does this thing where her and my ex-stepdad rotate between their place here and their place down south, so she keeps her car here, but still a very crappy situation. Am I the jerk for charging my aunt and uncle to babysit my little cousins? So I, 18 female, routinely babysit for my aunt and uncle as they both work a lot. I currently babysit their kids, two one-year-olds and one eight-year-old, five days a week from 8 a.m. till 8 p.m. The older cousin is in school for most of those hours, so he's not so much trouble. I just need to pick him up and ensure he has dinner and does his homework, etc. But it's the twins that I'm primarily taking care of. I recently told my aunt and uncle that as this is severely cutting into my ability to look for a job and start making my own money, that I could only contribute if they paid me and threw out a ballpark figure of 80 pounds a week, which is far less than I'd make in a full-time job and much cheaper than paying a stranger to take care of the kids. We are family after all, so I don't want to overcharge them. They also make good money, so this would be in no way hurting them. It seems, however, this was a mistake, as my aunt blew up about how entitled I am and how you don't charge family to babysit and began to rattle off how I have free access to their Wi-Fi and their food, etc. I pointed out that taking care of two one-year-olds, I have basically no time to go on the Wi-Fi and that I can't eat their food and have to bring my own as I'm vegan and 90% of their stuff isn't compatible with that, which led to a huge argument. I was eventually told to get out. My aunt has now taken to social media to rant about how spoiled and entitled I am and how she's not going to pay someone for the easy job of taking care of two babies who are basically no work, which is hilarious as I can assure you the two one-year-olds are not easy to take care of. My parents are now up in arms over this defending me and my mom is not talking to her sister. I just feel awful for causing this family drama. Should I have just continued to do it for free? Not the jerk. Stop babysitting immediately. 12 hour days, five days a week, for free? She's crazy. Tell her you're not her slave. You're not even a babysitter. You're a full blown nanny working overtime for free. Don't accept that 80 pounds when she changes her tune and realizes what real babysitting rates are. Get a job, earn a salary, live your life. ETA, I've lived in London. I bet they're going to the pub a few hours every day after work before coming home, leaving them virtually no time with their kids. These people are downright despicable. ETA again, not one person here has rated you the jerk, not even the trolls. That should tell you something. Info, what do you want to do for a living? What's your life plan? What are your GCSEs in? Before you started working for free, what did you want to do with your life? You're at the age where you need to think about yourself, your future, your finances. Giving away your precious hours to a well-off couple that doesn't even appreciate them isn't the way to go. You'll look back and wish you'd furthered your own life instead of helping further theirs. Lastly, the concept of family is overrated. You're going out of your way to help your family. They're going out of their way to do you over. Your definition of family is vastly different from theirs. Genetic math? If you say so. When I was a sophomore in high school, our biology teacher gave us a genetic math assignment. We were to use our parents' blood types to determine our possible blood types and then confirm our work by typing our blood in class. This was before current biohazard practices. I'm adopted and knew its implications on the assignment, but my teacher didn't ask and I was looking forward to having a little fun. He wasn't the worst teacher, but I didn't care for him. I'd been a blood donor, so I knew I was AB positive, and based on the assignment, that was not possible. Typing our blood involved pricking our finger, putting some on three separate glass sliders, and applying a drop of reactant on each slide. One reactant identified A, one B, and one positive and negative. Of course, all three indicated, so I showed the teacher my work with a confused look. Teacher, you've probably messed up with your test, each reactant goes only on one slide. Me. Yes, sir. That's what I did. Teacher. Well, something isn't quite right. Let's test again together. We test again. The result was the same. Teacher. I'm sorry. Someone must have mixed all these reactants. Let's get new bottles and test again. So I prick my finger a third time. Same result. Now the teacher is getting a little nervous. He's stammering a bit. I just look at him, waiting to see what he'll say. At this point, it's worth noting my biology teacher had only one volume setting, loud. Any conversation he ever had with any student was clearly heard by the whole class. Teacher, um, uh, 
do you perhaps have anyone you call uncle who isn't really your father? Me. Oh sure, Uncle Jim is really my second cousin, once removed on my mother's side. Teacher. Um, no. I mean, does your mom have any close male friends besides your dad? Me. Confused look. Teacher. So, I guess what I'm trying to say, uh... At this point, I'd had my fun. My teacher had beads of sweat on his brow and lip. I interrupted him. Oh, of course. I'm adopted. That was the last year he gave that assignment. Karen Niece doesn't appreciate my gift. I teach her a valuable lesson. For the past few years, every time I buy my niece anything, she complains about it. She has expensive taste, and while I'm not broke, I certainly do not have the money to buy what she asks for. I've told her this in the past, along with her mother. Both seem to understand, but my niece will still get a, that's all, attitude about her. One year, I got her a gift card to her favorite clothing store. It wasn't enough to buy a full outfit from there, but it would get her a pair of jeans or a sweater or something. She said, you expect me to be able to use this to buy something? Another, I flat out gave her cash to put towards one of the items on her list and I was told that it wasn't enough. So what was the point? She's 16 now. For her birthday in May, I sent her a gift card to a different store. When she called me to thank me, she said, Thank you, even though this isn't enough to buy anything. I was pretty upset and told my sister I wasn't buying her daughter anything else. She said that wasn't fair because our brother's kids always get something to open on Christmas. Yeah, because his kids aren't ungrateful about the gifts. They understand I'm not the aunt that can spoil them, but they appreciate their small gifts. I still don't want to cause drama on Christmas. Every year, I always get a kid from one of those organizations to buy a gift for. This year, I selected two, one of them wanting something within the budget I set for my nieces and nephews. I bought the present in my niece's name and made a nice handmade card detailing that a gift to a less fortunate kid had been made in her name. We couldn't be together this year for Christmas because of lockdown, but we did a Zoom celebration with everyone. My niece opened her gift and freaked out. She said it wasn't fair everyone else got a gift. I said, I figured this was something that was useful. She got even more upset, broke what my parents got her and stormed out of the room. My family has called me a jerk for this. They said it would have been better to not get her anything at all. Am I a jerk? Support our channel by joining as a member today and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. Or come watch this video next. You won't believe what Karen does in that one.